Good evening, everyone, and welcome to the Chelmsford Senior Center, where we're presenting the live spring session of the annual town meeting. The first time we have been back in this building for about two and a half years, thanks to COVID and the, the pandemic that ensued from that. Um, it's kind of a circus atmosphere here. A lot of people are back slapping and just glad to see each other. The Chelmsford High School Band led us just a moment ago in the uh, Star Spangled Banner. And uh, we're anxious to get back to business as usual. But there's a twist because now the town has 11 precincts, not the nine that we used to have. There's been some scrambling of, of uh, assignments and the town meeting reps have changed in number. Now there are 11 precincts with 15 reps in each. That's 165 total. And uh, from the looks of things, they're almost all here tonight. Um, and we look forward to a, a pretty great presentation. We have 35 articles on the town meeting warrant. Uh, ordinarily, that would be a cause for at least two or three nights of activity. But there's a new wrinkle that we've been using the last couple of years uh, through the uh, initiative of moderator John Curlin, and that's something called the consent agenda, where minor articles that are routinely brought up year after year are bundled together and voted on as one unless somebody objects. So there'll be 13 of those on the consent agenda. Those will be taken up pretty early in the proceeding. We'll first hear town meeting reports uh, from, from our town officials about especially the master plan that is being reworked and it, uh, pr an update for that is on the way. Then early in the going will be the annual budget for the fiscal 2023 operating plan. The, uh, there will be uh, four articles having to do with spending money, lots of it. But first will be Article 4, $3.7 million allocated for the Neshoba Valley Technical School. Then the school budget, which will be $67.5 million. The town operations, $69.8 million. And then finally, those are Articles 4, 5, and 6. Then finally, Article 8, which is the capital planning budget, what we spend on things, uh, that's $3.8 million. Now you might think with all of the uh, federal le relief money that came flowing into town. There wouldn't really be any need for capital improvements, nor for some of the expenditures that you'll hear later on involving things like uh, air conditioning systems for the McKay Library and so forth. But there's been a plan in place by the Board of Selectmen to uh, use that uh, stimulus money to uh, take care of, of one-time things that are in more desperate need. And uh, if you've been following the select boards meetings you know that a lot of that money has been spent most of it still some that has not and with a long list of things that are wanting uh, wanting more so in a moment here we're going to resume for the first time here in the senior center in quite a long time as i said and there is john curlin calling the meeting to order so enjoy the evening and we'll talk to you later on i pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America. And to the Republic for which it stands, one nation, under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Thank you. I'd like to officially call this sp spring 2022 town meeting to order. And at this point, I will turn the meeting over to our town clerk, Tricia Zuris, who will swear in all town meeting representatives who have not been previously sworn. Thank you. All right, may I have all town meeting reps who have not been sworn in yet, please stand and raise your right hand. Okay, I'm going to, going to do it a little different. I'm gonna say it, the whole thing, and you're all just gonna affirm at the end, okay? All right, do you all solemnly swear and affirm to faithfully and impartially discharge and perform all the duties incumbent upon you as a town meeting representative according to the bylaws and charter of the town of Jumsford, the laws of the Commonwealth, and the Constitution of the United States. Do you so swear? Excellent. You're duly sworn. Congratulations. At this point, um, would you please uh, hold up your clickers? Does everyone have their clickers? Okay. Um, has anyone found clicker number 95? That one seems to have been misplaced. 
Uh, perhaps it's out at the front desk now because no one seems to have located it within the hall. Uh, so we're going to test uh, as soon as uh, the screen changes. We will uh, test your clickers to make sure that they're functioning properly. And for those who haven't tuned in to town meeting for a while, this... Uh, these While we're waiting, I'd like to confirm that I've reviewed the uh, warrant and the service by our town constable and confirm that this meeting was duly served and posted in accordance with the laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. And you so see please um, pressure your clicker and vote and make sure that it says what you want it to say. This uh, automated system with the electronic... I'd also like to announce the location of the fire entrances and exits. There's two on each side, one towards the rear of the building. So uh, just in case. As I was saying, this electronic system has made voting very quick and uh, uh, certain in, in... Okay, we. I'm confirming that meetings. we do have a quorum. So that's a good thing. Um, <clears throat> If you have to leave the meeting early, kindly drop your electronic voting devices with the checkers in the front hall. And also, you can pick up up to two free COVID testing kits as you exit, if you wish. I would like to welcome all town meeting representatives to tonight's meeting and congratulate all of you, since all of you have been elected this year. As has been our practice, we have two screens so that all reps may read the articles and any amendments upon which you will be voting. You can also view the slides on the screen on your tablets, laptops, computers, or other smart devices. Simply log in using the instructions on the screen if they're there. And uh, <clears throat> uh, speaking of amendments, all amendments will be submitted on the forms which you can get either from the town clerk or me. If you know prior to town meeting that you intend to file an amendment, you can see me or Tricia Zuris prior to the meeting for the form, or you can email them to me, and I will make necessary copies and distribute them to town council and the typist so that they will be ready before town meeting begins. And if you get it to either of us prior to the introduction of that article, town council should have the opportunity to review the amendment, which will expedite our meeting. This form will create an original in three copies. The top white copy to the moderator, yellow copy to the amendment assistant, the pink copy to the town clerk, and the orange copy is retained by the maker of the amendment. I want to thank Chumser Telemedia for their assistance in setting up the screens, streaming and timer, and broadcasting this meeting. Here are the rules with respect to town meeting protocol and procedure. All questions and debate shall emanate from the microphone facing the moderator in the center of the hall and shall go through the moderator. Board or committee members, other town officials or department heads may use other microphones to answer questions or provide information to the meeting. Speakers shall refrain from asking rhetorical or argumentative questions and shall only ask questions seeking needed information. The questions should be in the who, what, when, where, and why mode. Kindly avoid argumentative questions that start or end with, isn't it true? Or wouldn't you admit? I would prefer not to have to rule questions out of order, but I am bound by the laws and regulations that define our conduct, and I will do my best to enforce them fairly and respectfully. I will, I will allow a reasonable amount for follow-up questions, but I will have to intervene if any individual is asking an excessive number of follow-up questions. All presenters of articles shall be limited to 10 minutes, and I shall notify each when they have one minute remaining. With respect to discussion, speakers are encouraged to be brief, and each speaker will be limited to three minutes of debate. Should you, be able to make, you should be able to make your points within three minutes. If you truly believe that this is not enough time for you to make your arguments, kindly advise me in advance, and I may allow some leeway. Speakers should ask their questions prior to engaging in discussion. Making inquiries will not be considered part of the three-minute discussion limit unless you have discarded, started discussion and then ask questions. Once the clock starts, it will not stop until the speaker does or time expires. I would appreciate being advised that a speaker is beginning discussion. 
A person should not speak a second time and shall only be given the opportunity to correct or dispute a statement of fact made by a previous speaker. This privilege will be narrowly construed by the moderator. We do have some other rules of protocol. Please do not refer to any prior speaker by name. The proper designation is to call him or her the previous speaker. Please refrain from personal attacks. Challenging or arguing in opposition to another's position is fair game and is what this meeting is all about. Intentional slander against any individual or group cannot be tolerated. Let us refrain from repeating arguments that have already been made, but new ideas or distinctions are welcome and encouraged. Discussion of pending litigation will not be permitted unless specifically included in the Warren article being debated. If during the course of discussion, I observe several speakers on one side of an issue, but none in opposition, I will interrupt debate to inquire if there are any who wish to express the opposing position or offer an amendment. If there are none, I shall end debate and move the question. If there is opposition, I will move that party to the front of the line and allow debate to continue. I trust that you will all appreciate how this will advance our mutual goal of moving town meeting along. To those who may be next in line, should I ever have to exercise this process, you have my apologies in advance. There will not be any debating from the presenter's podium. They may answer questions, but should they want to engage in debate, to presenters will have to queue up in line like everyone else. Transparency and effective governance are the two goals of town meeting. To expedite our meeting without affecting transparency, we have successfully employed a process called consent agenda. A consent agenda allows representatives to bundle several routine Warren articles into one so that instead of taking several separate votes on these uh, essentially bookkeeping articles, we take one vote on all of them. The town manager and I have discussed the type of articles that would be conducive to this process. These are articles that generally do not involve any questions or debate and are passed in the normal course of town meeting. <clears throat> I shall request a motion that the body vote to approve a consent agenda invo involving the articles to be included in the consent agenda. This still allows for questions and answers and discussions with the opportunity to add or delete consent agenda articles as town meeting deems best. The articles that I am suggesting for consent agenda are articles three, seven, and 13 through 23. Article three is an article in which no action is being requested. Out of regard for the presenters and your fellow town meeting representatives, I must respectfully request that there be no conversation at your tables. If I can hear background discussions up here, it means that there may be representatives who cannot hear the presentation, questions and answers, or discussions. Thank you. I will now turn the meeting over to our town manager, Paul Cohen. Good evening. When, good evening. My name is Paul Cohen, I'm town manager here in the town of Chelmsford, and welcome this evening and it's an honor to be before you this evening to present our, our Warren articles tonight. As our first order of business this evening, I'm gonna turn the podium over to Chelmsford resident John Souza in his capacity as cemetery commissioner for a special honor this evening. John. Thank you, town manager Cohen. I'd like to ask if Jerry Hardy could please come forward um, we are pleased to have the Hardy family join us this evening on this special occasion. This includes Jerry's wife, Sheila, son Jeffrey, our newestly, newly elected cemetery commissioner, and his son, Robert. Also attending tonight are fellow commissioner, Tom St. Germain, and our cemetery superintendent, David Boyle. It's an honor to, it's an honor to make this presentation. Um, having first met Jerry during my high school years, when I was working as a summer employee at the cemetery department. Later in life, I came to know Jerry as a superintendent and then most recently as a fellow commissioner. Jerry was first elected to the commission in 1974 
And for those of you that uh, may not be familiar with this elected board, the Cemetery Commission essentially functions like a board of directors. The commission appoints a superintendent to manage daily operations, establishes cemetery rules and regs, and approves expenditures from the trust funds. For decades, Jerry has volunteered countless hours and shared his knowledge and expertise with many superintendents, such as David, myself, and others that came before us, and their staffs to keep Chumsford's six cemeteries as attractive, welcoming places of burial for residents. During all these years, Jerry's highest priority has always been, uh, and always has been, serving the needs of bereaved families who have lost someone special. So on behalf of the town of Chumsford, I'd like to present you, Jerry, with this award as a token of our appreciation for your 48 years of service. Congratulations and thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, I got a confession to make. I'm a firm believer in term limits. <laughs> I've got to say it's been an honor to serve with a number of boards on the commission. As John pointed out, our mission was to make an attractive place for the, for the folks in the town of Chelmsford where they not for our cemeteries. Cemeteries are not only for the families of the, uh, who go through a funeral, but they're also for places to go and bereave afterwards. And it's very important to have a cemetery which, um, which is conducive and comfortable so families can be at quiet and uh, talk to their, uh, 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 communicate whatever you want to say with their loved ones. As an example, uh, I lost my 20-year-old year, son, and um, uh, for two years, I went to the cemetery, no matter what time of night it was, and uh, just to say, I love you, Chip, and I miss you. Uh, it was very important for me in the bereaving process, so uh, that has been motivating me ever since. Now, I'm going to talk to something that maybe is not in line with this. But years for years, the Cemetery Commission got $100 every July. And then there is, where is he? I'm not gonna mention names. A new manager came on and he took $100 away. Well, you know, every July I would say to my wife, honey, now you get dressed up and I'm gonna take you out for dinner when I get my $100 check. And Scrooge over there took my $100 check. So I had to go home and say to my wife, darling, I can't take you to this place uh, anymore. She said, sweetheart, we'll go to McDonald's, we'll go to Big Mac, and we'll split it, and we'll split the French fries, and it'll be just the same. Thank you very much. Well, I'm only the town manager. <laughs> uh, the first article this evening, is, as per every uh, annual town meeting, spring or fall, is the report of town officers and committees. And this evening, we have before us a report from the Master Plan Committee to be presented by George Zaharoulis, the chair of the Master Plan Committee. And then I'll follow that with a brief financial overview of tonight's meeting. George? Thank you very much. Um, the committee was made up of oh, let's find this you know, um, several members that were put together by the planning board. Uh, Nancy Arroway represented the planning board. Ken Lafave uh, represented the select board. Uh, William Bill Murphy was a citizen at large. Michael Raisback represented the planning board. He actually replaced Don Van Dyne. Don Van Dyne served for a year. Joe Reddy uh, was a town meeting representative, Scott Rummel, citizen at large, and myself. We also had uh, Fred Brusso from the Age Friendly Committee. Fred showed up at every single meeting, uh, took part in every meeting. The only thing he didn't do was, was vote, but he was a, a valuable part of uh, this committee. 
uh, I just wanted to point out Scott Rummel and Bill Murphy. This, I think this was one of the first committees they were on, and they did a super job on the committee. We had the advisors to the, the committee, Evan Belansky from Community Development, Northern Middlesex Council of Governments, uh, Beverly Woods, Jay Donovan, and Justin Howard, and Vivian Merrill did our minutes. We received input from uh, uh, town manager Paul Cohen, Lisa Maroney, business development, Gary Persichetti, uh, water districts, sewer department, the age friendly committee, and the senior center director, conservation commission, uh, Evan Belansky, BPAC, and which is by bicycle and pedestrian committee, and the historical commission. The committee timeline, the committee was appointed in April of 2019. The first meeting took place on May 7th, 2019, the committee met second and fourth Thursday. Uh, COVID caused us a four months that we didn't meet. Um, it really put a, a damper on things. And then uh, we, March 19th, we were gonna do a public uh, uh, input session. We canceled that because of COVID. We did resume the meetings via Zoom in July of 2020. Um, and June 22nd, 2021, we presented a draft to the planning board for input and the committee kept meeting until December of 2021. Um, the master plan 2020 is an update of the 2010 master plan. Uh, we didn't rewrite it. 2010 was really a, a, a rewrite from the beginning. We just updated this plan. The format of the 2010 plan did not change. The, the data was basically updated. We identified the issues and opportunities and, and new recommendations were created. Uh, some of the 2010 issues and opportunities and recommendations remained. Um, we presented again to the planning board in, in June of 2021, uh, and the planning board had two or three months of input. Uh, I met a few times at their meetings, uh, answered any questions they had, along with a few other, other members on the committee. Uh, planning board voted to endorse the master plan update uh, in January of this year. Um, and the planning board started to form an implementation committee um, at the same time. Uh, master plan was then presented to the Board of Selectmen in February of this year. The, what is a master plan? A master plan is a comprehensive and a far-reaching plan of action. A master plan is a document and a policy guide uh, designed to help communities create a vision of what they want to look like in the future. Master plan makes recommendations help guide communities physical development and out outlines implementation strategies that address land use issues, transportation, uh, community uh, facilities, services, local economy, environment, preservation. Master plans are not binding laws or regulations on their own. Master plan is a guide to create a plan of action for respective parties to implement the recommendations in the, in the master plan. But it's imperative that those respective parties research and obtain additional information prior to implementing the recommendations. So if there's something in there for the, for the planning board, they need to do a deeper dive and, and, and research to make sure it fits with what's going on at the time. The sections that, you have the sections of 2010 and 2021. They're the same sections, we did break out cultural and historic and natural resources into their own sections. The, the committee's process, what we did as a committee, we did a, a SWOT analysis. Um, it's basically strengths, weaknesses, opportunities, and threats, and how the members of that committee, uh, our committee, uh, viewed the, com uh, the town. Then we talked about public input. Each meeting opened with a session for public input. Anybody that wanted to come before us could come and speak, and uh, we would take that into consideration. Um, we discussed having public input sessions, but COVID really put a stop to that. So we created a survey and to my surprise, we had over 1,200 responses to the survey. And we had, we had a section in the survey that you could actually write comments in, and I think there was 77 pages of comments. Um, so it was actually better responses there than we did on the public input. When we did 2010, the public input sessions, we had about anywhere from 30 to 70 people, um, which was nice, because we kicked around ideas, but this survey was really good. Um, Master Plan Committee discussions, we, we updated uh, the data for each section, identified issues and opportunities and development recommendations. We also updated the letter to residents. So this is the vision statement that we ended up compiling afterwards. I think you all have it in your handout. I won't go and read it all, because um, it's gonna be a long night. 
Um, each section of the master plan developed their own goals. Um, so each section had goals. Um, and then we had sub goals. Oop. There we go. Uh, sub goals to, to those sections. Um, the role of the implementation committee is to alert respective boards and departments of the recommendations that we made in the plan, um, not to enforce or engage in actual, actual implementation of the recommendations, but basically to oversee and control to make sure that the boards understand that there's something in the master plan that they should be looking into. Um, they gather results and findings of the respective parties in order to keep the master plan recommendations updated. Uh, periodically, they should report back to the planning board on the progress and implementation of the recommendations of the master plan. Uh, and the master plan outlines um, the recommended composition of the implementation committee and the, and the planning board as putting that together. There's going to be citizens at large and there's going to be people from different departments. Uh, the master plan document is available on the town website. These are the links. Um, it's pretty straightforward. It's a pretty long document. Uh, please read through it. If you have comments, you should send them over to the planning board because now this plan is in their hands um, for their taking it from here and moving forward. That's, that's my uh, presentation. Thank you, George, and thank you to the Master Plan Committee for all your efforts over the last couple of years. Um, the final overview under this article is um, just to give you a sense of the meeting. There are 35 Warren articles uh, that will come before the town meeting at this spring session. Uh, you'll note that there are no zoning bylaw proposals, there are no general bylaw proposals, there are no charter amendments. It is essentially a financial town meeting, which um, and then there's a few easement issues at the end of the meeting. It really is, for many of you who know Dennis Reddy, it was really the spirit of what Dennis always sought to achieve, which was the spring is for finance and the fall is for zoning. And, uh, and I thought of Dennis as we were preparing for this meeting this evening. Um, that being said, uh, the good news is, is things are fine right now. Uh, the town accountant, Darlene Lucia, presented a report to the select board on Tuesday evening. Uh, last week and basically reported that as we're three quarters of the way through the fiscal year, the fiscal year is expected to close in the black. Uh, the town's undesignated free uh, fund balance or free cash will be certified by late summer, early fall. Basically our revenues are tracking at or above, slightly above forecast and departmental expenditures are in line. There, there are adjustments that we'll see in the next article, but basically overall it's good. The proposed operating budget for fiscal year 2023 that begins on July 1 is $149 million. Uh, there's a $3.77 million capital expenditure plan, which uh, John Souza, our finance director, will present later this evening. And then there are other financial warrant articles based on a level service budget. Basically, we do zero-based budgeting. We, we Each fall, fall in October, when we start the process, we go through, whether it's the general government side or the school committee, we basically build the budget person by person, expense by expense, uh, for the upcoming year to achieve a level service budget, in this case, in general parameters. Um, what is not included in accordance with the town bylaws is that there is no funding for collective bargaining agreements. On the general government side, um, all of our collective bargaining agreements will expire at the end of this fiscal year. And therefore, when those agreements are reached on the general government side, we'll come back to town meeting for funding approval, which is ratification of those agreements. On the school committee side, they're under a different provision of state law. Funding is in their budget, and, and therefore, when they reach agreement, as they have already with their administrators' union, they vote and ratify, and it's part of their operational budget. Um, the only caution, as I mentioned at the end, is we're in a particular time, rather unusual. Um, I've been doing this 32 years. I lived, you know, I was younger at the time uh, in the late 70s, early 80s, you know, 40 years ago where we were, were experiencing inflation levels that we haven't seen since that time. Um, we also have the instability of going on uh, with supply chains as a result of the pandemic and the crisis in Ukraine and Russia. Um, it's a very extraordinary time with the, the shortage of labor force. Um, and much like everyone else in this room and across the town and across the country and really across the world, we see the impacts whether we're at the grocery store, the gas station, uh, the hardware store, or you know any other aspect of, of, of our community. And so I think we're sort of cautiously moving forward 
as, you know, as are others, and, and in fact, we, we see the state legislature, and that's a quote I, I took uh, this evening on the slide from two weeks ago, and, and the legislature, the state, state house is actually taking up the budget today, and he wrote that these good times may not roll forever. We want to make sure that we have money in case there's a sudden downturn. You know we're on the brink of a major confrontations in Europe. The oil production is being cut way down. If I was an economic prognosticator, I would think we were in for some tough times. So obviously we want to strengthen our ability to pivot if revenues do take a downward plunge. So with that being said, like I said, we're, we're comfortable where we are today and where we're going into fiscal year tw uh, 23. And like I said, we're cautious and, and as everyone is in terms of what may happen beyond there because these are sort of unprecedented times and we, we know the Fed and others and, and global leaders and such will work to, to put us into a smooth landing from, from these turbulent situations. So with that, Mr. Moderator, that concludes my presentation under Article 1. We now move on to the consent agenda. Yes. Um, <clears throat> for the record, you may have a copy of the, um, the uh, motions for the spring annual town meeting that omitted Article 18. Um, uh, when I saw that it was omitted, I discussed that with, town, uh, with our town manager. Uh, that article has to do with the funding for uh, Chemsford Telemedia, which is a routine uh, in line. We've, we've done consent, that in consent agendas in the past. So I'm adding that. So I will entertain a motion to um, uh, uh, consider a consent agenda for the uh, following 13 Warren articles, Article 3, Article 7, Articles 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, 22, and 23. And uh, this requires a two-thirds vote. So do you want to speak on this, Mr. Thorne? Uh, Glenn Thorne, Precinct 7. Uh, I think the consent agenda is good, but I have one question. On uh, Article 7, the Finance Committee voted unanimously to reject the $400,000 in Article 7. I'd like to get an explanation of what that was. That is a mistype on the summary. It, if you look at the actual uh, discussion up in front or in the actual article descriptions behind, we approved unanimously. So the summary is incorrect. The summary is incorrect. My question is answered. Thank, Thank you. you. Sheila Pichette, Precinct 10. One quick question. Could somebody refresh my memory and let me know how these funds are audited? How they're, how they're, how they're, you want to come up and just, yeah, just can't hear you. Um, uh, these revolving accounts are audited just like the general fund accounts are. They, watch, they take in, look at all the receipts that go into those accounts, and they audit all the expenditures that go into those accounts. So that's one area in the general account, or is it audited individually and then it goes into? Nope. The, so they, they, uh, they audit, they audit every, so the auditors audit every fund in my general ledger and all the accounts that go into the, so it's, because a lot of these accounts are special, they're special accounts so that they can, the funding can only be used for that particular purpose. That's one of the things that the auditors actually look for, is that, that those expenditures were used for what that purpose was used for, was set up for. Okay, thanks a lot. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Richard Freitas, Precinct 9. I have a question on Article 13. Could you please explain me where that Reserve fund is going to okay, come Okay, um, uh, the town manager is actually now going to, if, once we vote on the consent agenda, he is going to present each article, but then you're going to take one vote. So you will have an opportunity to ask the questions about the specific Warren articles. But we will already have voted on it. No, all you're voting is whether it's going to be included in the consent agenda. Now, if you have an objection to that, that's fine. And, and if you're- I'm just asking a question, that's That's all. fine. Go ahead. Yeah, I, I will. I will go over that in the presentation of how the fund fund is uh, is established, how it is, money goes in, and how money goes gets placed out of the account. 
Yeah. And, and, and just for the record, if you vote to approve the consent agenda, and then while the questions are going on, you can take an article out of the consent agenda. Okay? Thank you. So this would require, if there's no one else, this does require a two-thirds vote. The article passes 124 in favor, five in opposition, one abstention. Thank, thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'll now go through each of the articles uh, under the consent agenda. The first one is Article 3. There's no action being requested under Article 3. This was a placeholder I had for collective bargaining agreements in case any were reached in time for this meeting. We now move on to Article 7, which is going to take me a moment to get there, going through different slides. Okay, Article 7 is a request to raise and appropriate $400,000 to be used as a reserve fund uh, for the upcoming fiscal years in accordance with state law. Th this uh, Finance Committee is authorized to transfer from the reserve fund to provide for extraordinary unforeseen expenditures that arise during the course of the year. It basically allows for a rapid response in lieu of convening a special town meeting. The fund has been established at $400,000 now for I think about eight years consecutive um, and again, during the course of the year, particularly at the end of the year, we, we occasionally may, may draw from it at special town meeting. Uh, there was an instance this year was drawn from uh, in order to put boilers in at the Byam and Harrington schools for replacement uh, during the uh, winter vacation period. Um, and so again, it, it allows that action to take place rather than convening a special town meeting for the community. We now move on to the series of articles beginning with Article 13. And then we'll go right through the, through the end of that list. So Article 13 is to accept the provision of state law, which is Chapter 40, Section 13E, to establish a special education reserve fund. This, this request was brought forth by uh, Dr. Lang and the school committee. Um, and basically what it is, it, it allows the community to establish a special fund to meet unexpected uh, or an unbudgeted special education costs that may arise during the course of a fiscal year in either tuition or transportation. Um, so how it would work in practice is at the end of a given fiscal year, if there are available funds left in the school committee's budget appropriation, they're, they're allowed to then transfer some of those funds into the a special education reserve fund. The total balance of the fund in accordance with state statute can exceed 2% of the annual net school spending in the community, which at this point would be $1.5 million. Um, how, the interesting part of this uh, statute is the, to take money out of the funds, it not only requires a majority vote of the school committee, but a majority vote of the select board. So basically what happens is, is if there's a favorable year and uh, uh, the school committee has uh, funds available at the end of the year, they can put funds in this, and then in a subsequent fiscal year, it, it sits as like a stabilization fund, and then they can draw upon it with the vote not only of the school committee, but of the select board at that time. Article 14 is the annual authorization of the sewer enterprise fund operating budget. Uh, in this case, we have a $4.5 million sewer operating budget, uh, where you can see about a, a 1.225 million is in personnel and 3.3 million is in expenses. Basically how an enterprise fund works is it's a separate accounting and financial reporting system as the town accountant describes. Only sewer revenues from, from sewer bills goes into that account and then it's audited and monitored that only expense, expenditures that come out of that account are, are for sewer purposes. Um, this year's sewer enterprise budget increases by 2.5% at the amount of $111,000 for the upcoming fiscal year. Following that is the stormwater management enterprise fund. 
similar purpose to operate the stormwater management system for the year. As you can see, the budget's 1.5 million, roughly half between personnel and services. Again, it's a level service budget. Uh, the budget increases only less than 1%. It's for almost $13,000 for the maintenance of our 95 miles of drains, 4,500 catch basins, 600 drainage outlets, 210 culverts, 50 detention ponds. And in accordance with the state and federal mandates and requirements, they have to go out and, and sample drainage outflows, uh, clean the catch basins, and do street sweeping at least, at least twice a year in order to protect the uh, streams in our community. Article 16 is the annual renewal of the Chelmsford Forum Ice Rink Enterprise Fund. This is again level funded at $60,000. So basically the forum is operated outside of the property tax. The funds that the town receives from a management company that operates the forum um, goes to uh, meet the expenses that the town has for the forum in its upkeep. Article 17 is for public education and government access and cable related enterprise fund. Same thing, the funds, the budget is $605,000, roughly two thirds is personnel, one third is expenses. Um, revenues for, for this enterprise come, come from the 4.5% assessment on your Comcast and Verizon table, cable television bills. Um, the good news is that despite the trend of people cutting the cord, cable access revenues have remained within their budgeted forecast levels in recent years. Article 18 is a request from Chelmsford Telemedia to transfer $90,000 from the cable, television, public, edu educational, and government access fund, undesignated fund balance for the enhancement of the Chelmsford Telemedia cable access production studio that is located within the Parker Middle School. And basically, this is what they're seeking to do. If, if you've ever t filmed in there or watched the programs, uh, they need to go in there and basically bring it into the second decade of the 21st century by replacing the switchers the studio cameras, the uh, PTZ cameras, which is a fancy acronym for point tilt zoom. It's those bubble cameras that you often see in, in rooms. Uh, it tripods, pedestals, monitors, uh, and, and the labor to have this work completed. Article 19 is the golf course enterprise fund. Similar to the Chelmsford Forum, the town owns the golf course but puts out a management contract for the operations of the golf course enterprise operations and therefore the revenue that comes in from that management company is then used for the maintenance and, and upkeep of the golf course, extraordinary beyond the regular upkeep that, a, um, that the golf course company does during the normal operations, again, outside of the property tax levy. Article 20, you see at every spring annual town meeting, we're required by state statute to reauthorize the uh, departmental revolving funds um, that have been established and are part of the town bylaws. And I think the state does this just to keep it in front of the people in case questions arise. And again, it's audited annually. So this means that the um, senior citizen trip program, uh, the revenues go in there, are used for the senior citizen trip program. Same thing with um, cemetery wreath and floral decorations. And then the most recent one was the on-site sewer facility that if someone puts an on-site septic system, the funds that the Board of Health receives for that permit goes to pay the inspectors to perform that work. Um, this, these numbers are upper bounds. Um, you know, it is, if the fund comes in at half or quarter or two thirds, whatever, it, it really has no significance. It's not an expenditure or authorization. It's just an authorization. It doesn't, it's not an appropriation of funds. Uh, and, and then Article 21 is, is the request for the Cemetery Commission for the sale, from the sale of lots and up, uh, of lots to the Cemetery Improvement and Development Fund. This uh, town meeting's request is $40,000. And for those of you who have been watching town meetings in the, fast, in the past or traveling down Riverneck Road, you see that they're nearing the completion of the expansion of the Pine Ridge Cemetery. And so funding is needed to install the lot markers, loaming, seeding, hydro seeding, fencing and paving. Um, Article 22 is the uh, annual appropriation of $10,000 uh, for the Community Action Program Fund that was established by town meeting back in 1996. And this program was established to provide small cash awards and grants to individuals and organizations to develop civic projects that benefit the community. Now, since that time, there's been over 100 projects totaling over $130,000. And then the final action under the uh, our consent agenda is Article 23, which is 
the Affordable Housing Stabilization Fund. There's no action because there are no funds currently in the Affordable Housing Stabilization Fund. The, you may recall the most recent action at the February town meeting was a transfer of uh, the funds from that fund towards the project uh, uh, at the former UMass Lowell campus. And since that time, there's been no uh, influx of funds into that account. That's the consent agenda, Mr. Moderator. Does anyone have a mic microphone that works? Uh, no, does uh, anyone have any questions or uh, comments? Otherwise, we'll, oh, Mary. Mary France, Precinct 6. Paul, my usual comment, will the sewer uh, budget require an increase in fees this year in our sewer no, fees? No, there'll be no, inf no increase in sewer rates this year. Great, thank you. Thank you. All right, um, so we're gonna vote on these 13 uh, articles as one vote and uh, it's recommendations a, oh I'm sorry I got ahead of myself does the finance committee have a recommendation the finance committee unanimously recommends approval of articles 7 13 14 15 16 17 18 19 20 21 22 and takes no action on 323 <laughs> does the does the select does the select board have a recommendation the select board unanimously recommends approval of Article 7, Articles 13 through 22, and took no action on Articles 3 and 23. Thank you. I think, th I think that's all we need. Um, all right, so now we can vote on this, since everybody seems to be in favor of it, other than you people, but we'll know soon. Um, so this is a, a simple majority. All in favor is to approve the consent agenda articles. And uh, some of you heard a couple of times in there, Chelmsford Telemedia has mentioned uh, the volunteers that are bringing you the programming tonight work out of the Parker Middle School. And uh, I, I remember when that used to be a computer room for the school district a long time ago, and we uh, took it and have made great use of it, and it has become a little shop worn. And so we're hoping to get some funding as this consent agenda will allow to uh, overhaul so what the So the article got passes there. 134 in favor, two opposed, one abstention. So uh, now get, go, go forward, Mr. Manager. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article two, is, as customary, is the beginning of the spring annual town meeting are adjustments to the current fiscal year's operating budget. Last June, the, we adopted a budget uh, for the fiscal year that began July 1 through this June 30th. Um, obviously, never, everything ever goes quite as you planned, and, uh, and particularly this year, as we continue to battle COVID and the other challenges before us. Um, a few weeks ago, we sat with the town accountant and the finance director, with the department heads, reviewed where we stand and, and sort of cost out to finish the fiscal year, and we have the four, following four transfers for your consideration this evening. We're seeking to transfer $353,780 from line item 17, benefits and insurance, to the following line items. Line item four, public safety personnel services, 145,000. Line item five, public safety expenses, 85,000. Line item 10, municipal facilities expenses, 98,780. And article, line item 14, community services expenses, 25,000. And now I'll give you the detail and I, hopefully it's able for you to see, but I'll describe it. Basically in the area of public safety, which consists of police, fire, and inspectional services, we really, this comes down to some personnel, uh, unforeseen uh, activity that took place, uh, particularly in the inspections area. We lost our, we had to final, lost and change our building commissioner and had to do the payout there. And then shortly thereafter, um, our assistant building commissioner was another long-term employee. We paid the accrued benefits and then refilled those positions uh, and then actually had to add one because of the staff load with the transition in the office. Uh, in the area of the fire department, um, again, we had retirements uh, and overtime, you know, notably during COVID, um, dur during the course of the year was a challenge. And then in the police salary accounts, you know, we had retirements that, that again, some we don't foresee. For example, Deputy Chief Ahern retired and is now the chief of, you know, in South Portland. So that's not factored into the budget that we build for the year. So when something like that happens, you have a long-term employee, we've got to then pay out the, his accrued time. And, and then 
And then we also entered into an agreement during the course of the year with the town of Tingsboro for animal control officer services. And how that worked is we gave them a slight bump in pay, but the revenue that comes in from Tingsboro doesn't go into the budget. It goes to the town's general fund and becomes part of the local receipts and revenues. Uh, of, of, so that's why we needed additional salary in that account. On the expense side, again, we, we had additional unforeseen costs in fire vehicle maintenance uh, and diesel fuel costs. Uh, and police side, the, we, we, when we prepared the budget, we didn't anticipate the purchase of the scheduling software and new defibrillators for the cruisers. And then you can see there's a list of, of unforeseen expenses in the facilities beyond the, the $300,000 budget that we have for maintenance of our, of our 26 buildings in the community. And, and finally, in veterans services, we've had an increase in demand on veterans benefits in this year. Our budget's $125,000. Uh, we forecast that we need another $25,000 to close out the fiscal year. And then how that actually works is under the state law, we, we provide the veterans benefits and then about 12 or 18 months later, the state reimburses us 75% of the actual costs that we have in a given year after we report them to the state at the closeout. That's the presentation under Article 2, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Uh, does the uh, Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 2. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 2. Are there any questions or debate? There being none, we will uh, vote on Article 2. Simple majority on this. The article passes unanimously, 135 in favor, no opposition or abstentions. Thank you. Article 4. Article 4 is the Neshoba Valley Technical School District fiscal year 2023 assessment. I'm going to turn over the podium to Neshoba, Chelmsford Neshoba Valley Technical School District member Lawrence McDonald. Uh, who will introduce the school business manager for Neshoba Tech. Our superintendent, Denise Pigeon, has a conflict this evening. She's attending a town meeting in AIR that's taking place at this time, and their assessment's going up a lot more than Chelmsford, so that was probably a place for her to be this evening. <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Town Manager. Uh, I'm Lawrence McDonald. I'm one of the representatives from Chelmsford on the Neshoba Tech School Committee, along with Don Ayer, Sam Poulton, and Claire Janot. With me this evening is our business manager, Michelle Shepard. Oops. A second. Neshoba Tech, Chelmsford's skill focused public high school. There's many amazing students and individuals at Neshoba Tech that are winning awards, uh, gold medals, silver medals, bronze medals from Skills USA, culinary competitions like the Taste of Neshoba, being selected by the Department of Elementary and Secondary Education to work on programs for them. But one amazing young woman who goes to Neshoba Tech is Savannah Gooden from Chelmsford, and she is in the health assisting program, and she used her training to save somebody's life recently. You may have read about this in the newspaper. One of her coworkers at the Walgreens Pharmacy collapsed. She didn't hesitate to spring to action and started CPR and informed the EMTs what was going on and saved somebody's life. Just one of the amazing Chelmsford students at Neshoba Tech. Each year we like to show the enrollment trends year over year. They don't really move that much. Uh, currently there are 
uh, eight additional students from last year, an increase from 735 to 743. These include all students at Neshoba Tech. And the district-wide students increased from uh, 667 to 688, that's 21, which means there was also a decrease in school choice students and there were no changes in the non-resident enrollment. Uh, the breakdown of the enrollment by percentage at Neshoba Tech is there. Chumsford is about 30 percent, and it's the largest percentage of the school population. Uh, Interesting fact, in 1976, Chelmsford had 313 students at Neshoba Tech. That was the all-time high. Currently, there's 207 Chelmsford students uh, at Neshoba Tech. And this slide isn't showing everything, but they break out to 40% into the uh, construction and transportation cluster, 30% into the health and services cluster, and 30% into the arts and technology cluster. So it's a pretty even split of where the students go, which means they're attracted to the variety of the technical programs that are offered at Neshoba Tech. The budget. The proposed budget for FY 2023. It is $16,639,152. That is a change of $637,402, which is 3.98%, which is driven by contractual increases and fixed costs and increased capital needs, along with some of the inflationary pressures that uh, Paul Cohen talked about earlier. Fuel costs are going up and those sorts of things, the supply chain issues. We are adding one additional full-time employee, that is a special ed employee who we are capturing in this budget. Due to Yes, due to student needs, uh, Neshoba Tech has a higher level of high needs population than the state average, and we try to meet those in the least invasive, most inclusive way. Uh, and I think that school does a great job with that. The revenue plan is that 67% of the revenue comes from the assessments. And as we all know, the assessments are driven by the state formulas. The town of Chumpsford's, well, the Chapter 70 school aid has gone up 4.37%. Chapter 71 regional transportation has gone up. Um, I will remind everybody, as a regional district, Neshoba Tech can't charge anything for transportation. Uh, excess and deficiencies are being rolled back into the budget. School choice revenues are down because there are fewer school choice students, and that's probably a trend that will continue over time. And then there are some other non-assessment revenues, such as grants and pandemic money. The minimum contribution by the state formula has gone up 5.4% this year. Uh, capital equipment is going up, and we'll talk about that in a minute. And um, do you want to talk about some of this? Okay, so this is, it's 100% of the E and D. I didn't, I failed to say it was 100%. So as you can see here from this pie chart, two thirds of the money comes from the towns and only 23% of the money comes from Chapter 70. Uh, the E&D is 5%. As you know, Neshoba Tech has a history of rolling back in 
100% of the E&D from the previous budget, and is 2% for school choice. Okay. Yep. Oh, sorry, Mr. Moderator. Um, this is the total assessment. So 67% of our budget is $11,123,645 dollars. The Chumpsford assessment is $3,729,524 dollars, and that is being driven by the increase in the minimum formula, but also a decrease in five students overall in the student population this year for an increase of $8,122. Oh, percentage, thank you. The percentage of the increase is 0.22%. And I wanna remind everybody that the services at Neshoba Tech that are available to the public, the veterinary clinic, the automotive and collision, design and visual programming, marketing, the bank, and my favorite, the restaurant. Oops. So I apologize. I moved past mine. Sir? Well said. I am, sir. Thank you very much. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 4. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 4. Does the Neshoba Valley Technical High School School Committee have a recommendation? We unanimously approve the budget, sir. All right. Anyone have any questions? There being none, we'll take a vote on the uh, Let's just stay here for a second. Neshoba Valley Technical High School budget. The article passes unanimously, 135 in favor, no, uh, no negative votes, and no abstentions. Thank you very much. Thank you. The next article, Article 5, is the fiscal year 2023 operating budget for the Chelmsford Public Schools. I'm going to turn the podium over to Dr. Jay Lang, our superintendent of schools. Good evening, everyone. Um, thank you. I hope everyone is having a good uh, evening. I'm going to walk you through the Chelmsford Public Schools uh, budget request for fiscal uh, 23. A couple of highlights. Um, you know, very happy to report that overall we've had a very good and positive uh, school year. We've been able to manage uh, COVID, I think, very well. Um, right since the uh, start of the planning last summer, right through the fall and, and winter months, we've had teams of uh, staff, administrators, um, uh, teachers, uh, paraprofessional support staffs working to make sure that our schools could stay open. I'm very proud of the fact that uh, we have been in person for the whole school year. Everyone really kind of rowing in the same direction, which has been great. As a district, we have put in uh, several mitigation uh, measures to be able to keep our schools open. Uh, early on, we were really focusing on social distancing and hand washing and mask wearing, and that is still optional for our students at this point. Um, we also spent a significant amount of time working with our contracted cleaning services providers uh, to increase some of their services on a daily and weekly basis. Um, we have COVID pool testing that takes place in the buildings. We implemented a test and stay program. We also, uh, about two months ago, uh, launched um, at-home test kit options for families. So we really have done a lot to try to ensure that our kids can be in school and learning over the course of the year. And we're very happy that that has been able to, uh, to happen. Um, thank you. <laughs> <clears throat> I appreciate the one clap. Uh, 
So every year, we're just going to go through a couple of quick highlights for you, but every year we do take a look at our comparable districts. This is not something that I pick. This is uh, districts that the state actually designates are our comparable districts. These are the districts that are most similar to us in size and program and the number of students that we serve. Um, you have our total enrollments, economic uh, uh, students with special uh, needs, L populations, just to give you a sense of the communities that we most align to. And a couple of uh, slides that we look at every year, uh, and we always end up in the middle, and I think that's something that we've been uh, proud of. We've always been in the middle or uh, towards the top of the list as far as these things are concerned. Our student-teacher ra uh, ratios, again, right in the middle of our comparable districts. They're a little bit um, higher than the state average. Uh, this is a slide where you want to actually be at the top of the slide as opposed to the bottom, and you'll see we're right in the middle uh, with this particular grouping. Our uh, per-pupil expenditures, again, um, we'd like to be uh, close to the top. We're below the state average in per-pupil spending, um, but we're right in the middle of the pack as far as our comparable districts are concerned, uh, which really means we're not spending too much, we're not spending too little, uh, we're in the middle of that particular grouping. One area that we are low in, and I'm going to touch on this a little bit later in one of our slides, is our average teacher salary. We want to be competitive and we want to really, um, I very much appreciate the work that our teachers do, particularly coming out of this pandemic. They have done incredible work uh, and I'm, I'm very proud to be their superintendent and work daily with them. Um, this is a number that we have to work to increase over the next number of years and we are going to be going into contract negotiations. Uh, we don't want to be in the bottom of this list, particularly in the economy that we're in, in the market that we're in, trying to compete for uh, staff. This is something that we do need to, uh, to work on. And again, it's another slide we look at every year. We've kind of slipped a little bit. Again, this is a slide we'd like to be near the top and um, we're finding ourselves uh, closer to the bottom. So this is an area we need to improve upon. Again, the budget before you this evening um, very much is aligned with our goals and visions. Uh, it keeps uh, going in the same direction. We've used, utilized every revenue um, offset that we possibly can uh, in our budget. We obviously receive local funds from the town. We very much appreciate that. We receive uh, circuit breaker funding uh, to help offset special education costs. That's incorporated in the budget. We do take in about 50 school choice students each year, and we receive revenue for taking in those students. Uh, we've incorporated that funding in the budget. Uh, and then we work with Valley Collaborative. That's our special education collaborative school. Um, we have some students that go to Valley, and then we also actually receive um, some revenue offset from Valley because they're only able to uh, maintain at the end of their fiscal year a certain uh, level of funding in their accounts. And when they're, uh, they have overfunding, we end up getting money back. Uh, this year we ended up getting about a half a million dollars back from Valley and that was one of the reasons that we potentially wanted to set up that special ed reserve fund or the stabilization fund for us so that if we have a year where we have some special ed funds coming back from Valley, if we can then set them aside in kind of like a savings account for a future unanticipated expense, we'd be able to control that within the school budget and we wouldn't have to come back to town meeting uh, to request a funding transfer on some of those unknown uh, categories. As I mentioned earlier, our collective bargaining agreements uh, do all expire at the end of uh, June, with the exception of one group. So we are in the very early stages of negotiations um, with all of our employee union groups. Uh, the budget itself before you tonight, again, really aligns our uh, services. It takes a look at our goals, values, and visions, and makes sure that our dollars that we're spending are uh, aligned to that. Um, as we've done historically, anytime we have an opening uh, due to a retirement, I actually incorporate that into the budget document and we assume an outgoing teacher would be replaced on average with a new teacher coming into the district at a master's step three category. So I've already accounted for that savings between the, the retiring individual and the individual on an average that's going to come in to uh, replace them. There is one area in the budget this year that we've had to make uh, some investments in, and that is within the world of uh, special education. Um, at our middle schools, uh, we are going to be implementing a new language-based program at uh, Parker Middle School in the fall. It'll really service the whole district, but we do have a, um, a group of students who would really benefit from a language-based program that have some reading disabilities that we could much better accommodate and help in district as opposed to having to look at uh, potential out-of-district placements for those students. So we do have funding in the budget to account for that. And we also have two classrooms at Chelmsford High School where we have a significant number of students moving up from middle schools. Uh, our Life Skills Pay program at the high school and then our STEP program at the high school um, have increases where we need to actually add an additional special education teacher in those two buildings at, um, sorry, in those two programs at Chelmsford High School. So funding has been included for that. 
Um, outside of the actual local funding, one of the things we're very proud about going into the pandemic, it was really helpful as well. Um, this is going to be the fourth and final year of our 101 computer initiative so that all of our students in the district in grades uh, 5 through 12 uh, next fall will actually have their own district issued uh, laptop so they can take it home, they can use it in school. Uh, that was um, honestly the timing was great when we hit the pandemic and everyone needed that extra technology and we all needed to be on the same page. Um, so this is going to be the, uh, the year that actually everyone in grades 5 to 12, it was a, a four year program, we're going to be fully uh, implementing and we have used um, either our local funding or our school choice funding to be able to uh, ac accomplish that. We have not used uh, funding from uh, town meeting for that, so we're happy about that. And then lastly, one of the things we did have to take a look at within our budget, this doesn't add FTEs or additional positions to the budget, but our rates, our individual rates for like a day-to-day -day substitute teacher or in particular this, uh, this uh, time of the year, it's been very difficult to get substitute school nurses uh, because obviously a uh, little bit of a nursing shortage and we're so close to Boston uh, and with COVID and whatnot, nurses kind of have their pick of where they'd like to work. Our rates were considerably lower than other local communities around us. So we do need to increase our day-to-day -day rights again for um, substitutes and nurses. And that has all been incorporated into the budget. It does not add FTE to the budget, but we have adjusted those rates so that we can be a little bit more competitive and make sure that we have teachers in front of our students and we have nurses to care for them if, um, if anything were to happen while they're in school. Um, so in closing, uh, worked very closely with Town Manager uh, Cohen, our school committee, and select board on the recommendation that's before you this evening. Um, it is an increase uh, in a budget of $67.5 million to support the operation of the Chelmsford Public Schools. Thank you. Thank you. Does the finance... Go ahead if you want. Does the finance committee have a recommendation? The finance committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 5. Does the select board have a recommendation? The select board unanimously recommends approval of Article 5. Does the uh, Chemsford School Committee have a recommendation? Uh, school budget. Thank you. All right, any questions? Hi. I'm just curious about the Valley Co uh, Collaborative and the budget that's set for them, I mean, it's great that you're getting a half million dollars back from them, but wouldn't it be better if they didn't charge as much to begin with? Yeah, the issue that they have, and I actually serve as the representative on the board for Valley for the school committee, um, the COVID years were very tough for them as well, as far as when they had uh, rate increases uh, set. Um, it was just very difficult as far as their population, uh, having them in school. We're only actually charged when we have our students attending school there. So they were a little bit off over the last couple of years with, with COVID and whatnot. This is the largest increase we've received from them. Um, we can go in and actually adjust as a board the rates. The issue with Valley is we have a, I'm going to ballpark about 60% of the students at the collaborative are member district students, and then we take in students from non member districts. Um, so the board itself, it almost uh, works because we don't want to give a discount to the non member dis uh, districts to send their students to the collaborative. It almost works out this way, and it's been something that the, um, the auditors on the, the Valley Collaborative side and then obviously the board of directors um, have worked with. So we can either take it as a cash or we could take it as a credit that we could apply to our tuitions uh, in these circumstances. Thank you. Thank you. Any other questions? There being none, we will vote on the uh, Chemsford Public School budget. Uh, this is Kelly Beatty for Chelmsford Telemedia. I, for one, am stunned that a budget of this magnitude is passing with such overwhelming support. Unanimous votes by the board, the select board, the uh, finance committee, and of course the uh, sc uh, school uh, board. And so, uh, what you're seeing here is a is a, a vote of confidence, I would say, not only in the schools themselves, but in the leadership of Dr. Jay Lang, the superintendent, who has um, navigated through these difficult times as he acknowledged the, the service and, and dedication of the teachers. Uh, there are Thank certainly you. complications, but Final um, vote is 131 great. in favor, one opposed, no abstentions. The article passes. Mr. Manager. Article 6 is the general government operating budget for the upcoming fiscal year. 
you can see we're raising, appropriating almost $70 million, uh, and other funding comes in from the revolving funds to pay for benefits and revenue enhancements. And we vote this by line items for municipal administration, by personnel and expenses, uh, out of district education, meaning non Chelsea Public Schools under Shoba Tech, public safety, public works, municipal facilities, cemetery, community services, library, benefits and insurance, and debt and interest, as, as uh, detailed in the yellow budget books that you received this evening. Um, in summary, as I stated at the beginning of the meeting, it's a $149 million operating budget. $116 million comes from the property tax levy, so roughly three quarters of it. Uh, 18.8 .8 million in state aid, and that appears to be a solid number based on the governor's proposed budget and the budget that's being debated now by the House of Representatives in which the Ways and Means Committee had us at the same funding level. Uh, local receipts, which is primary uh, motor vehicle excise tax and permit fees, and then available funds. Um, as noted in the budget you just approved, the public schools budget is up by $2.5 million, or 3.85%. Other departmental budgets, 33.6 million, so roughly or about half the amount of the school's budget. For the other operational budgets of the town, that budget's up by almost 5% to 1.6 million. Benefits and insurance, which are your health insurance for active and, and, and uh, retired employees, your retirement assessment, property casualty liability insurance, that's up by 5% to 1.3 million to 28.3 million. And then our debt service is declining. Out of the $149 million budget, only $11.5 million is in debt service. That's a decrease of $1.1 million or 8.86%. And the question becomes, where do, why do the increases? Why do the taxes go up every year? What happens if it's a level service budget? Well, as we know, our largest expenditure is personnel, um, but then we do get hit with expenditure increases. For example, our retirement assessment from the Middlesex County Retirement System is going up by $655,000. Uh, our health insurance premiums, are up 3.5% this year, 513,000. Our solid waste and recycling collection, we're in the final years of our solid waste and recycling collection uh, contracts for collection and disposal, it's 125,000. Road salt uh, is up $100,000. Uh, many of you may recall during this past winter, uh, the price of road salt went from $47 per ton to over $63 per ton. Uh, so that's our budget for the upcoming fiscal year. Same thing issued with contracting snow removal. As you may recall, a few months ago, there were all the news stories, both the television media and local print media, about how the state and local communities could not find people interested in doing snow removal. So we've had to increase our rates, uh, much like the superintendents had to raise rates to get um, substitute teachers and so forth. Uh, gasoline and diesel fuel, this is one that we pivoted. I mean, when I submitted the budget at the end of January, we had a dollar amount. Uh, working with the Finance Committee as they finalized the budget at the end of March, we basically tried to adjust for the dollar in increase in gasoline and diesel fuel costs. There's an $80,000 increase for police, fire, public works, and other vehicle operations. This upcoming year, we have three elections as opposed to the current year when we had just the town election. We have a state primary just after Labor Day, and we have a general election in, in November in which the governor's race and others will be on the ticket. So we've got to fund the two additional elections. That'll cost us an additional $53,000. And we noted earlier about our, our aged buildings and the need for public facilities uh, equipment repair. Um, we're also investing in the weed pond control. Um, you may have read some of the accounts that we experienced it last summer, particularly at, at Freeman Lake. The warmer climate uh, and the warmer uh, 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 water body levels are doing a devastating impact on weed control. And so we're going to be out there. We, 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 we got funding in the fall where we're out there treating. This is going for the ongoing maintenance for this upcoming summer and next spring. Uh, and then DPW road materials, which again is another petroleum product. That's my presentation, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 6. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 6. Time for questions, discussion. Alvin Drayman, uh, Precinct 7. Just a simple question. Uh, the benefit and insurance uh, budget item, mm -hmm. that includes ta town employees. Does that also include uh, the school department employees? Yes. In, in, in the town, unlike the, the regional school district, Neshoa Tech, which is its own governmental entity, in the community, the town's benefits budget covers school department employees and all other departmental employees of the town, active and retired. Yes. 
Thank for, you. For, for uh, retired, I come by the state retirement system, but non-teacher retirees, schools, and the active employees in the school and the town, yes. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? There being none, we'll vote on the uh, Town of Chelmsford budget. And away we go. You almost have to be paying close attention to even know that the town meeting representatives in the last 10 minutes have authorized more than $125 million of budgetary authority. I think those of you with a long memory can recall when uh, budgets were much tighter and there was extended debate over, you know, adding or getting rid of one employee in a in the police force or in the school teachers uh, uh, school nurses and such <clears throat> but you see here uh, uh, reflected by the article the nearly passes 122 unanimous in favor one opposed one abstention nearly article unanimous eight. approval by the town meeting representatives Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article 8 of the town's fiscal year 2023 capital budget of $3.77 million. That's based upon a recommendation of the Capital Planning Committee. I'm going to turn the podium over to John Souza, who chairs the Capital Planning Committee. Thank you, Mr. Manager. Good evening. The Capital Planning Committee met, held public meetings last November and December. And just to show you a list here. And the committee voted uh, to recommend 16 projects totaling just over 3.77 million. This first slide shows a summary of all of the projects broke, broken out by functional area. And you can see that the most significant investments are in the areas of school buildings that accounts for about 43% of the total, uh, followed by public works, which is about 24% of the total, and then public safety, which is uh, just under 23% of the total. If moving on, we'd like to uh, just take a quick look at um, some of the projects in more detail. And I wanted to mention that all of the, you can read more about these projects in the um, spiral bound budget book beginning uh, about halfway through the book in section H. Uh, all of these projects are shown in more detail. Uh, it's actually on, on the page um, H3. There's a summary in the project detail sheets begin on H20. So the first area is municipal technology, and there are two projects slated for the capital improvement plan. The first is a, a replacement of all network switches in our municipal network for a cost of 130000 The second is a continuation you've probably seen in years past that we're, um, we've been transitioning a number of our municipal buildings in town to a electronic uh, door security system and getting away from the older style mechanical keys and locks. The cost for that is 100000 and the buildings uh, slated for this to receive this type of system are the fire stations, our libraries, and our senior center. Then we move on to municipal administration. In this area, this is this project at a cost of 53,000 is a, is a um, continuation of um, our town clerk's efforts to streamline and, and better organize the many of the public records that we have in the town office building. And so, for this project, uh, you can see that um, this includes digitizing and all the planning and zoning files that are um, currently stored in the lower level room three in the town office building, as well as some upgrading some shelving and adding some archival quality shelving in the town clerk's vault. Now moving on to in the community services area, uh, both, both our libraries are in need of um, some masonry repairs for a number of projects, and the cost for this is 60,000, and you can see in the photo, this is actually a, a uh, chimney cap that uh, is in need of repair at the, at the uh, Adams Library. Then we move on to public safety. Uh, two projects for the fire department that involve replacing uh, two 2008 vehicles. The first is a uh, sport utility vehicle type, uh, just at a cost of just under 58,000. It replaces an older 2008 Ford Explorer. And then the other is a more major project that involves the replacement of uh, Fire Engine 3, which is also a model year 2008. And you can see that cost is just over 785000 Then we move into the area of public works. 
uh, we have two projects uh, for public works infrastructure. The first involves sidewalk construction and repairs for 350,000, as well as road improvements for 400,000. Uh, sidewalk construction expects to be, um, the work expects to be concentrated around um, Old Westford Road, Fletcher Street, and other areas. The road improvements would include uh, Manning Road, Biltmore Ave, Cliff Road, and Rack Road. And then moving on to Public Works Vehicles, the next project is 165,000. This project replaces an older 2005 model sanding truck uh, to keep the sanding truck fleet updated. And then we move into the municip municipal facilities area. The next project um, includes 55,000 to replace an older 2006 model year pickup truck. It's shown there. And then we move into the area of school uh, facilities improvements. And the first project involves um, some, H some uh, HVAC work for a cost of just over 156000 This involves cleaning um, and servicing duct work and air handling distribution devices at a number of lo school locations throughout town. It also includes the replacement of some hot water convector units at the Westlands Community Ed Center. There is a safety-related uh, project that involves stairwell and stair tread upgrades that's a cost of just over 135000 And these, this, the locations for this work include the Byam, Harrington, and Parker schools. And as the slide shows, this, in, this involves um, resurfacing those stair treads so that they have uh, code-compliant rubber stair treads for better traction, as well as any of the concrete stairwells that may have chips, divots over the years, that includes repairing the concrete as well. Um, then we move on to um, the next project involves the complete renovation of all the restrooms at the Westlands Community Ed Center. And this project is just over 455,000. So it involves re renovating all the, the fixtures in the restrooms and um, installing ADA compliant fixtures and partitions. Um, this building dates back to the late 60s and although repairs have certainly been made over the years, uh, this is the first major restroom renovation that we're aware of. Next, we, the, the next project involves um, upgrades to the gymnasiums at the South Rowan Center Schools. This is a safety related um, project. It involves repairing the gym walls and installing protective pads along the wall behind the basketball backboard areas and some Floor repairs will also be um, completed in, these t in this project. And then we move on to the McCarthy School. This involves a complete upgrade to the kitchen. Uh, the, the cost is just over 438000 And for those of you that have been attending for many years, you, you've probably been noticing that the school administration has been working hard in the school committee to systematically go through all of the buildings and upgrade many of the kitchen facilities. And so this year it happens to be McCarthy, and you can see the, um, what this involves, adding new equipment, non-slip flooring, et cetera. And then the final school facilities project involves Chumsford High School. This is um, a boiler replacement at a cost of 325000 And you can see that it, the existing duct work and piping will remain in place for that project. So that concludes a look at the all the different capital projects. If, um, if there are any questions, I'll be glad to try to answer those. Thank you. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 8. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 8. Any questions or discussion? See if it works. Hi, Ginger Scoop, uh, Four Dalton Road, Precinct Five, uh, A or B. I can never remember. Um, I have a question about the public works section of the capital budget. Um, you mentioned the um, sidewalk construction and alluded to a couple of roads there, um, and I'm, I just have a couple of questions. One is, because this is capital budget, is this sidewalk construction only new sidewalks or does it include repairs for sidewalks? Are those two things separate, separately funded? 
Mr. Monterey, could I ask our, our public works director to, to assist me with the answer of that? Sure. Thank you. Hi, good evening. Yes, it's repairs more than anything else. Yep. Okay, so it's repairs yep. of existing yes. sidewalk. Uh, Great. Right now, this year we're on 129, doing a large section, and that's going to continue. Okay. Yep. Um, my next question, that being the case, um, does this include uh, repairs of the brick sidewalks in the center in addition to others, or is it mostly focused on those asphalt sidewalks? No, it, re it includes both, especially where there's any ADA <coughs> hazards. Yep. Okay. Um, and um, my last question is, where uh, where is the list of the exact streets that are going to be getting done so that the residents can take a look? It's on our website, and uh, you can see that we've already started. Uh, there's a whole group that's been done. There's two more groups to be done as we continue on. What you have to do is you have to um, grind and remove it and have to raise the castings, and yeah. now those streets are getting paved. And then once they're done, we'll move on to the next section. But you can find it on our website. Okay. And that, that will specifically have sidewalks separated from road improvements? Yes. And then my last question was about road improvements. <coughs> Roadway improvements does not in, is really paving, not <coughs> construction of sidewalks to a road. So those two things are? Yes. Okay. Road improvements Great. are for roads. Exactly. Um, Mr. Moderator, I'd like to start discussion. Sure. Um, I just have a couple of comments for DPW. I'm going to keep coming back up here and talking about it. We, this past couple of years, have had serious changes in the way that we've had accessibility to our schools. The sidewalk issue continues to be a problem where our school, our si houses within the area where our, we are charged for busing is forced on us because our kids cannot safely walk to school. I continue to urge DPW to please coordinate with the school transportation departments in identifying where the highest needs for sidewalk improvements and sidewalk building is so that our kids can have a much more accessible option for getting to school. We're a beautiful town. In most cases, it's a very safe place except on those large pass-through roads, which actually happen to be a lot of the roads right around our schools within the one to two mile radius. Lastly, I'll continue to say the brick in our center, while beautiful as it may be, is almost twice, sometimes three times more to repair and add than asphalt sidewalks. And the fact that the one small section of our town is getting that much of our sidewalk construction money each year is ridiculous. And it really needs to be evaluated and determined whether or not that is, re in fact, the best moving forward. It may seem like a sunk cost, but over time, it's pulling away from where we really need sidewalks. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? Badriu Pippen, Precinct 11. Um, I would like to ask the question regarding the boiler replacement for the um, high school, I believe, which is a 325K. Um, what is the expected lifetime of the boiler? High school boilers that you're looking at there the year. first generation of aircos that were put in the town. Um, they're 95% full modulating condensing boilers. They've saved $81,000 a year since they're put in 21 years ago at the high school, so that's over $1.6 million. They are, are at, they are at their life expectancy. They will be changed. If you look at the very first one to the right, you can see it's a different boiler. That's the newer style. That's not being changed. That boiler is 
um, set aside strictly for the domestic hot water, and it does that. So you'll see the other four change. Life expectancy now has grown a little bit on them. They're probably around 20 years because they're full modulating and condensing. They don't have the life span as the old cast iron boilers, but the difference is if you're going to save 1.6 million in a 20 year period, you should be able to re uh, be able to buy them again and put them in instead of working with something that's very inefficient. And the other thing is because they're full modulating and they work the way they do, you're running part of that boiler system without running the whole thing, where before if you had two 8 million BTU boilers, you're running 8 million, you're running half of that plant until you need the second one, then you're running two. So you can't get under the 16 when you're in uh, conditions that are below zero. At this point, the way they work is if you are uh, Cold in the morning, you might have four boilers running at 66%. If the sun's out and you're warming up in the afternoon, you could be down to one boiler doing about 52%, and you could be going from 180 degree water down to 140, 145. And um, thanks for that. Um, so you're saying that the new, the new installation would have a lifetime of uh, another 20 years? Yes, approximately 20 years. Approximately yep. 20 years. And mm -hmm. um, as I understood, you said something about a $1.6 million. So the, when it, in 20 years, you're expecting this to be a $1.6 million? Um, yeah, I mean, uh, the, the, only thing I can, the only thing I can say is, I mean, I, I, wouldn't, I wouldn't say the last two years have reaped the same amount that the rest have because of COVID. I mean, we've been starting systems up earlier. We've been running outdoor temperatures. Uh, bringing a lot more fresh air over the last year and a half to two years, and we'll continue to do that until the pandemic's done. So I would say there's a little bit of loss in all the schools for this and town buildings for that point. Understood. Yep. Um, again, in your assessment, could you say, um, and this, this is maybe subjective depending on how the school um, building uh, boards plans for a new high school might be, but what would be the expected lifetime um, that's still left on the school building. On which school building? This is for the high school. <laughs> well, um, let's see. The building was built in 72. Uh, unfortunately, uh, doc, uh, Dr. Lang has been through the MSBC, uh, MSBA on multiple trips to try to get us a new high school, which has been very unsuccessful for the simple fact that there's more needs needed in poorer communities or people that don't do well with the maintenance of their buildings because we do, we can't seem to find our way to that. So I would say if we continue what we're doing, your life expectancy will continue. I mean, these buildings are 50, 60, 70, 80 year buildings that way. The difference is um, you're, you're taking care of your infrastructure, now you gotta find a way to continue on with your items that don't fall under capital. Ceiling tiles, painting, you know, the more easy stuff, but they don't fall in that category, we're gonna do it. But we have, we have no structural issues at the high school right now that are causing any issues. Okay, thanks. Um, have we looked at, in the ages of the town going into last spring, the town voted um, to try and get moving along to net zero, and I know that the DPW has been doing a great job on looking at technologies where it's feasible to go to more greener technologies. Have we looked at um, a competitive quote or what it might take us to go to a geothermal system, which is the most efficient and clean yeah. energy? Yeah, uh, geothermal was looked at the high school years ago. There's a bunch of problems with geothermal in general with existing buildings. Most existing buildings do not have the footprint for it. Uh, it's very, very common and done uh, marvelously well in new installations, brand new buildings, because most of that system ends up underneath your asphalt um, where the storage is. It's very hard. We did not have the ability to do it here. I don't see it really happening in too many of the existing buildings at this point in time, but I would think moving forward if you're going to. On another note, I think you're very well aware we're going from a gas-fired um, plant right now at the Chumsford Forum to electric, that'll be our first all electric, um, which will uh, meet the green community. Um, we've, you know, purchased our, um, uh, the first part of our fleet of all electric vehicles this past year. So we're moving in a direction that we need to and slowly taking 
the older vehicles. I mean, along with that, we just up, um, when we upgraded that, we downgraded the other three vehicles that moved, which two are hybrids, one wasn't, and got rid of, again, Ford Explorers and more cars that are gas guzzlers. So we are following suit. We are looking at all of that when we do projects. Yes. So, so in that vein, could you then tell me um, what is the relative 20-year carbon footprint of this gas boiler versus an electric, um, all-electric boiler system? Off the top of my head, I certainly could not tell you that. I and don't, would I that don't be know. something that's that we need to is. have as an estimate data before we approve this line item because that is subject to the, the town's goal of becoming Well, your problem is you're going to go from $325,000 to probably well over $700,000, 600000 because you're going to have to change everything around to make that happen. And I don't know if with all the schools we have, all the town buildings we have, and the fact that we have all the time trying to spend your money in the best possible way we can, if that makes sense. And right now today. But I mean, you, okay. that's what this board right here is for. Thank you. Thank, Thank you. you. Um, Thank Mr. you. Moderator, we must start the um, um, clock for discussion or debate. I would urge the um, uh, members of the uh, town meeting not to approve this $325,000 until uh, an efficient 20-year um, plan or a green offset plan has been studied and it, inclusive of the carbon footprint. Yeah, you would, you, would have to, you would have to offer an amendment to strike that particular line item from the capital budget. You, the, the, the budget is going to be voted okay. on is, as a whole. So if you want to do an amendment, you can come up and get an amendment form or I, 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 would, I would need some help. I've not done an amendment in this manner first, so if there's someone who can help me, I would, well, I would we, encourage we, that. We do happen to have an attorney here. Okay, I will, I will walk up and, and, and uh, speak about that, but do I do the amendment first or talk about it, or how, how do you want me to proceed? Well, since you're proposing an amendment, it would be best if you have the amendment done before you talk about it. Okay, thank you for the uh, sure. counsel. I will head up and, and talk about that. Thanks. My name is Sean McCurry from Precinct 5. This is my first town meeting. Welcome. Who can one talk to outside of this venue about the plan that is in place for sidewalks? Basically, I'd recommend you bring those suggestions to the select board. Let me, this past fiscal year, the town did a comprehensive assessment of every road mile in the community and sidewalks. Basically, we hired a consulting contractor who drove across every road mile in the community and evaluated the condition of the roadways and the needed investments to bring it up to a standard. Uh, and then there was a uh, similar plan on our town sidewalks. That plan was presented to the select board a couple of months ago. It was discussed at the select board meeting and a detailed five-year plan for paving was put out. And that list, as, as, as Public Works Director Gary Persichetti described earlier, lists every year and the proposed paving surface for that roadway. What came out in that plan is because of the fact that the state's Chapter 90, which is basically your gas tax, uh, has been level funded essentially to the communities of the Commonwealth for the last 10 years. Basically, in Town of Chelmsford receives $1.2 million of Chapter 90 highway funds per year from the, this, the proportion of the state's gas tax, and that's based upon road miles, population, and employment in a community. Um, and that's how it's been distributed, and it was only one year in 2016 when the governor, uh, newly Governor Baker, came in that year. He gave an extra $100 million statewide as opposed to the $200 million that was annually provided. That was a one-time thing, and the town received an extra $500,000 or so that year. So that's been our paving plan. And then we come and ask for $400,000 for road paving and then $200,000 for sidewalks. As we said, the, the road did a score and analysis of all the roads in the community. Our score was 79 out of 100. And the analysis determined that in order to bring the towns, all the town's roadways to, a, to an A level or 100% level, it would take $39 million of funding for the community. To do. Towards that end, the communities, uh, including Chelmsford, we speak to our state legislators and, and such and say, you know, is there a way to increase our Chapter 90 state funding? 
And thus far, we've not seen that action either by the governor or the legislature. So now we're left with a situation where the roads are deteriorating and obviously our traffic levels are not decreasing. And particularly a year like this year, which was a very difficult year for potholes, you know, we're out there repairing potholes and we've now got a situation where we're basically trying to do an investment and you just don't go and take the worst roads and make the investment because you have different categories of roads. You have primary roads which carry a lot of traffic such as Chelmsford Street, you have your secondary roads, um, and then you have your, your cul-de-sacs and dead-end roads. And then also if you're making the investment in that resource where you've got insufficient funds, you tend to actually invest in some of the roads that are in good condition before they fully deteriorate by crack sailing and other investment. So the bottom line is we, we have a, and, and it's, it's all shown in maps and plans, and you can see it online at the website and, and come to the select board where this plan was discussed and presented to the board. But we have a severe challenge in front of us to do roadway paving, which prevents us from, from basically doing justice. The, basically, the purchasing power of the 1.2 million the town has received now for 10 years is 40% less today than it was 10 years ago because of inflation. And then if you, obviously if you're looking forward, we're seeing further increases from petroleum in terms of our paving efforts. So at this point, we're, we're really struggling to do our roadway efforts. And again, we present the plan to the select board um, in terms of what we can do. And then we've also made a recommendation that if the town has any cash reserves or balances at the end of the year as determined by free cash, that we look to come back at the fall town meeting and appropriate some of those funds for, to continually invest in our roadway infrastructure. It's a significant challenge, but the short answer to your question is that's the overview of our road condition, and, I, and if you have concerns, I suggest you bring it directly to the select board. Thank you. Am I allowed to respond? Uh, you, want to, uh, you want to speak now and discuss the um, article? I want, I want to follow up to my question. So oh, yes, my question? answer would be yes. yes. Oh, sure. Um, I, I know that there have been, uh, that different uh, companies have been hired to look into this for us in the 70s, the 80s, and the 90s. Uh, places like Edwin McCann and Associates. What they've all found in all those reports that you're referring to is that we need to create pathways to schools, as has been mentioned earlier. For My issue is, is that the plans that these companies that you've hired, outside consultants, since the 1970s, the biggest one I believe was in the early 1980s by Edward McCain or McCann and Associates, you don't follow the... Let me take that back. I don't want to be okay, you said sir. earlier. Is this, there, is this a if question? The issue, is, is this, I'm, I'm, I just I want to ask my question right now. Who can one come to to find out why the plans that are in place, such as the 2015 plan, is not being followed now? There are roadways, as, as the person from the public works, those plans are online. The road is in the color to be done and completed by, say, 2019, mm -hmm. and it's not been completed, or it's been completely removed. And it is, it is a close road to a school. So my question is, how does one find out how roads are being added and removed to these lists seemingly ad hoc? Th through you, Mr. Moderator. The, the question, I don't si no, the question is sidewalks. Okay, the question is sidewalks, correct? Yes, sir. Basically, the decision at this point is due to the fact that we're so behind in the condition of our roadways, we're not adding a single foot of new sidewalk in this community for the direction of the select board, and I've not heard any further direction from the school committee in that matter. We are that far behind, and we're losing ground in our, in our maintaining our roadways. And the last thing you do when you're, when you're behind in your capital is adding more sidewalks to, to, to pave and to maintain, and also to clear. The other challenge that we have is and we have to utilize DPW personnel to go out and clear sidewalks after every snowstorm of snow and ice. So we just don't have the financial capacity to construct additional sidewalks because of the deficit we're in with our roadways, nor do we have the, the manpower personnel to be out there clearing those sidewalks because of the, because of the, the deficit that we're in right now where we're struggling to look forward with a plan to, to sort of keep us level at the, at the condition that we are right now. And so again, a, absent any further direction from the select board and request from the school committee, we're not adding another foot of sidewalk in this community. I mean, that's a logical answer. There are sidewalks being added they're not following the plans from the consultants that have been hired since Okay, the now are you engaging in discussion or are, do you have another question? Thank you for your, for your help. Um, I suppose my question is yet again, 
if I understand you correctly, you're saying to direct these questions to the select board? What, what I'm saying is if you see a new foot of sidewalk constructed in this community, you go to the select board and say, what is going on? The town manager told us on April 25th, 2022, yes, there wouldn't be another new foot of sidewalk. And you know what? I'll ask the question of DPW. What are you doing adding another foot of sidewalk? It couldn't be clearer to me at this point, because we had plans. I agree, we had plans. But because we're struggling with the maintenance of what we have out there and falling behind, and the, the increasing cost to, of, of, of road paving and grinding and everything else, we're not adding a foot of new sidewalk in this community, and, and, and probably for the foreseeable future, but you know, because we're that far in the hole. Okay. A discussion, then. My, my response, though, is to say just very quickly, there is yet another plan being put on the internet for the adding of sidewalks. It's there. I, I read it this, this, this year. And there's roadways that are in color and marked off that we're not going to follow. The one that, that I'm talking about, um, the reason I moved to Chelmsford was the one from 2015 that said there would be sidewalks on, on this guy's road. And, um, there's not, and the whole plan that was available recently is totally different from the 2015 plan, which is totally different from the 2010 plan, which is totally different. Going backwards in time to the earliest one I could find from the 1970s. Mm -hmm. And you have answered my question, though. Who do I say, hey, why does this keep changing? It's the select board, if I, just to be absolutely abundantly clear. That's the best place to bring it. They hold me accountable, they hold, and then I hold the DPW accountable. But I can tell you, like I said, it's clear to me, we're not adding any new sidewalks. Obviously, what will happen is every year we'll continue to assess the condition of our roads and, side, and sidewalks. So we'll repair, the repair and repaving may alter, but there's no, there's no new construction in the works beyond what, what is, exists out there today. Okay. Thank you. Okay, <clears throat> we do have an amendment uh, to uh, Article 8, um, and the uh, amendment basically wants to strike the words, high school boiler replacement, $325,000. So now we will, uh, the proponent can, uh, I mean, you've, you've made your point, but you certainly can make it again as, as sure. far as debate. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, members of the town meeting. Um, the intent of, um, uh, my name is Badri Uplip, and I also am an, on the um, uh, committee, um, advisory committee to the select board on clean energy and sustainability. And we're on the path to getting, as was established last uh, spring, a uh, town meeting that we resolved as a town to move towards net zero. And the, the questions that I'm asking here are essentially to try and move the ball towards net zero, which is zero carbon output, as close as possible. I, I think we'll never reach the net zero goal, um, realistically speaking, but we have to get there and think about it in an overall systematic manner. My request, therefore, is for the amendment uh, or is to have this $325,000 removed from this, maybe held in a general fund or something so that it can be approved in the fall time frame uh, once a comprehensive or a little bit more data and information has been gathered as to what the impact of this on the 20-year uh, the life cycle is essentially and or if something else can be done. This is because the particular uh, building will have another 70 years of lifetime potentially after the, at least a shell in the uh, aspect and any geothermal system or elect, uh, upgraded electric system very likely could have a very long life that is commis commiserate with the length of the uh, building shell that shall exist. I believe even if a new high school was to be approved and built in, in 10 or 12 years, this particular building will stand and probably become a new middle school or an expanded capacity. Therefore, we will be moving to a better system. A geothermal system is very efficient, is fairly clean when run on a clean electricity uh, program, and therefore I request that this particular item be held. And going forward as, as a way, this is one of the themes that some of us will ask the question and, and continue on, is that capital projects be assessed 
for sustainability or environmental impact as an index, as a score, so that you all are aware that we are moving towards this particular goal. We did vote on this net zero um, uh, goal and resolution um, last spring with about probably about 110, 120 votes, if I'm not mistaken, representing the interest. We are talking about an impact to the future generations. I understand that there is the now, the exigency of now and limit, limiting with the budgets that we have, but it's very important for us to think about the future way out there for what, when we are not 30 there seconds. and for that. So I think it's important to have this, please vote on this for removal and holding in a separate fund until the fall or until we can have a systematic study done so that we can get this as a better process involved for okay, okay. I, I think that there has to be some understanding as to what a capital budget is. When you take out the $325,000 boiler, there is not something that we can borrow against. So they can, when you say put it in the general fund, we cannot do that. So I, I just want to make sure I understand what you're asking for because the, the whole town meeting has to vote on this. And I want to make sure they understand that we cannot vote to borrow money for something that we don't have a purpose for. Understood. In, in which case, this, would sh this should be removed, and we should bring back this as a separate one in, in the fall, if, if with subject to other uh, okay. particular Okay. I just wanted to make sure, them. because you did say something, and I want to make sure that no Thank you, Mr. Moderator, for clarification fine. for the general understanding. So that would be my argument. Thank you. Thank you. Good evening, Mr. Moderator. Doug Bruce, Precinct 11. Uh, I'm here to speak in opposition to the amendment. I support the $325,000 for the boilers. While I support the goals and objectives of the, of the sustainability committee, the committee has a goal of net zero by 2050. These boilers are at the uh, DPW director's uh, suggestion are approximately 20 year boilers. They will be coming up again for replacement before our 2050 goal. And maybe in another 20 years, we'll be better positioned to choose the most energy efficient and most uh, beneficial boilers. Maybe, but maybe in another 20 years, we'll have passed a uh, uh, high school uh, budget line item to build a new high school. I don't know. But for given the, given the circumstances of the last two years, the, the whole COVID thing, the increased air supply, uh, the more cycles of fresh air, I want to give the facilities management people as much flexibility as possible, and if that means replacing these boilers, I know we're not going off and buying the most, the cheapest, least efficient boilers off the shelf. So we're getting good stuff, and it's going to be an upgrade that's what, uh, to what's already there. So I support giving the, uh, the budget committee, giving the, the borrowing power, the flexibility to borrow this money, I support keeping the $325,000 in the budget, and I am opposed to the amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Got to look at my precinct. Uh, Dennis King, Precinct 8. I'm also a member of the school committee. Um, I also like to speak in opposition to this amendment. Um, this, this project is part of a 10-year capital plan that we've had for, um, I think we've been working on it for like the last, last five years. Um, and the whole goal of that capital plan was to make sure that our facilities uh, were appropriate for our students, um, that we didn't run into problems where things got ahead of ourselves. I know we have other districts around us where you know, they're, they're finding themselves in positions where their, their buildings aren't uh, up to snuff as far as uh, conditions for their students in terms of heating and other facilities. And, and the whole idea of this, this uh, capital plan was to make sure that didn't happen here in this um, this project here is part of that capital plan, and I think it's important that we, we, we maintain our facilities um, and, and make sure that we don't fall so, uh, find ourselves in any sort of hole. So I'd be, be in opposition to this amendment. Thank you. Hi, David Drayton, Precinct 5B. I have a, a question first. Sure. Um, I'm curious if this equipment, if it doesn't go, if this amendment goes through, and it doesn't go through until the fall, say. Will there be any chance of like kids being cold in the, in the winter or anything like that? Or is this equipment operational okay as it is? Definitely a good possibility of that. Um, two reasons, one, as I said, these are with a first generation of vehicle boilers. 
Um, some of the controls for these are not manufactured anymore, not in use, because they've been changed since. And with the age of them, I would very much believe that we could be down one or two, which of course, in a building that size would not be enough. So if you had two out of four running, there's no way in cold days you're gonna support that building. Okay, yeah. and then I have a, a second question then. Sure. Um, so the way I'm kind of viewing this is from like a, a cost benefit perspective. For, like for the, the sustainability committee just doesn't have this information right now. It seems like you do have. Um, in terms of what the cost of this, um, the potential geothermal system might be. Well, if this did not go through, mm -hmm. would we be able to work with you somehow to get those numbers anyway so that for the future we could make these cost-benefit analyses? I mean, without a doubt. I mean, we could certainly look at numbers. The problem is I don't think this is the time and place right now because of the need and where we're at. And again, I mean, it was, it was said uh, previous to you that, you know, even if these go another 20 years, we'll still be looking at this before uh, the 2025, 20, 2035 time frames, and you know, so I'm really not worried about that as much as keeping um, the schools running the way they are and making sure that we are where we need to be. So, can we relook at things like this? We most certainly can, um, but I don't think it's the appropriate time. I don't want to see, especially the largest school being a high school, having issues in the middle of a year. Your costs are almost double if you have to do it as an emergency repair than it is when you do it off season and you're not worrying about you know, heating, heating the schools and worrying about that at that point in time. Okay, thanks. You're Thank welcome. Thank you. Hi, Ginger Scoop, uh, Precinct 5 still. Um, just to follow up on that, Gary, um, sure. or Mr. Moderator, through you to the speaker. Um, so the intended spending timeline on this is to spend it soon to order and replace these over the some off season. Over the summer months to be back ready for school. Yeah. Okay, great. And the so reason why the cost is that is because you're basically doing a one for one, yes. Okay. Um, there's some laws that have changed, so the duct work will have to change slightly, but you're not doing it all over again. The pads will house the boilers, so you're not adding to those. So there's a lot of costs that aren't included in this, which would be included in something that's gonna change the footprint. No, I understand, I just, I was trying to figure sure. out timing and one of the previous speakers yep. had talked mm -hmm. about waiting until the fall, just trying to figure out what, mm -hmm. the, what the pros and cons are. Thank you. Oh, um, one point of discussion. I will redirect my urging from Gary and his DPW guys over to the select board. Um, since we now have finally a new piece of information that um, our town manager has provided us that y'all are why we're not getting sidewalks. So we'll see you soon. Okay, thank you. Hello, Sean McCurry, Precinct 5 again. Uh, I have a follow-up question. On, uh, on, the, on the boilers? Cause on the sidewalk, sir. Oh, no, no. Right now, we're, we're talking about the amendment, which only deals with removing the boilers. Uh, we're we're going to get back to the article, and you can certainly follow up on that. Thank you for your patience. Sure. Okay. Anything else? So the matter before us right now is an amendment to remove the language, strike it, high school boiler replacement, $325 from the proposed capital budget. A vote in favor of this amendment will remove that from the budget. And as you heard from the uh, Clean Energy and Sustainability Committee, a traditional boiler replacing the one that's there will continue to use fossil fuels. And uh, I attended one of the committee's meetings. There's, there's a lot of interest in what are called um, geothermal heat pumps where the, the pipe is stuck into the ground and, and uh, exchanges water with the subterranean temperature. But unfortunately, it uh, looks like it's, it's not getting much traction with the town meeting amendment representatives. amendment fails, seven in favor, 121 opposed, one abstention. Now we go back to the uh, capital budget. 
and we're back to the original capital budget. And if anybody has any questions, some people did and now they've gone. I don't know wh where we are. Hello, Christine McNamara, Precinct 8. This is my first uh, town rep meeting, so hello. Again, congratulations. Yay. I just had a quick question on the SUV vehicle replacement. I was just wondering if that was a plan for an electric or no, since you were talking about sustainability. Where's Gary? Just wondering. Yes, that, that would be an electric vehicle. And then also I was wondering about the um, kitchen upgrade in McCarthy, whether that's also like electric stoves and that sort of thing, because I know that a lot of them are gas. Yes, yeah, sorry for the interruption. Uh, the, um, the SUV for the fire department, and our fire chief I know is here, uh, is planned to be an electric vehicle. Oh, great. And did you hear the follow-up about I'm the, um, in McCarthy for the kitchen upgrade? I was just curious if they're planning to do electric in there as well, instead of gas stoves. I'm sorry, which project was this, this school? Um, the, the kitchen upgrade kitchen in McCarthy. Upgrade. Yep, please. Actually, it's a combination of both. Some of the appliances are gas, and some will definitely be electric. It's not all electric. Yeah. No. Okay, is that something that was considered, or is it just yes. sort of maintaining yep. Yep. what we had? It's some of it's for the efficiency and how quick you can cook to get uh, students back to, you know, the classrooms, and lunches are really um, tight. So there is a combination of both, though, yes. Where okay. we can go electric, we have. All right, thank you. Yep. Thank you. Anyone else? There being none, we will vote on Article 8, the proposed capital budget. Uh, this does require a two-thirds vote. The capital budget is always kind of an easy target for uh, not nickel and diming because the numbers are much bigger than that, but to, to look at individual planned expenditures and ask why that one or why not this one uh, kind of questioning. It has been smoother these past few years than, than it was in the past. Um, it's interesting that some of the equipment <coughs> is very expensive, such as the boiler for the high school, $325,000. Obviously, there's, there's more to it than that, but it gives you a sense of the scale of the, the needs, uh, some of the needs and, and in terms of their costs. It appears that the town meeting reps are solidly in favor of this capital budget. The article passes unanimously, 130 in favor, no opposition, one abstention. Article 9. Yeah, Mr. Moderator, if I may interrupt for a point of personal privilege, um, I just want to take an opportunity to recognize Gary Persichetti. This will be his last town meeting with us. He'll be retiring on Memorial Day. And then before, while we're at it, we also have the pleasure this evening to introduce our new DPW director, a Chelmsford resident who has fortunately agreed to come on board and, and help us lead us to the future in public works. Christine Clancy is here this evening. Thank you. Article 9 is, is a request to accept an historic preservation restriction for the Fisk House in the town center. Um, obviously, many of you are familiar with the Fisk House and the work that's taking place in that area with the uh, reconstruction of the Odd Fellows building. Um, the owner of the whole parcel in the center um, obtained approval from the planning board in, in February, a couple months ago, to subdivide the lot that contains the Fisk House and the municipal parking area into two separate lots with a condition that a preservation be placed on the Fisk House with conditions that are reviewed by the Historical Commission and the Historic District Commission. 
The preservation restriction would provide that no alterations to the exterior of the Fisk House building occur unless they are of minor nature and do not affect the architectural or historical integrity of the building and it ensures that the property and building exterior is maintained. So again, this is a result of the planning board. As, as you know, that, that parcel has become fragmented where the Santander branch bank, the operating bank, has been sold off into a separate parcel with its lease. The restaurant that's being constructed, the old Oddfellows building with housing above, is a separate parcel. And then when they come in to separate the last two pieces, which is the uh, Fisk House, um, they put the, the uh, planning board required they go to a preservation commission. The Historic District Commission rapidly worked with town council and the property owner to agree to a restriction that's been signed by the commission and was signed at the, at the last select board meeting. So we have this uh, for your consideration and approval in order to preserve the Fisk House uh, in perpetuity. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee took no action on Article 9. Does the select board have a recommendation? The select board unanimously recommends approval of Article 9. Any questions? I'll be quick. Sue Carter, Precinct uh, 11. Um, <laughs> to think. Um, over the years, that property has gone into terrible states of dis disrepair. Um, when I was on the planning board in Santander, I think back when it was Bank of New England, they guaranteed to us that they would maintain it, and I remember many times with that fence falling apart. Does this preservation restriction have enforcement abilities or the ability for the town to step in and paint the fence or the building so it's not an eyesore if the owners going forward have wonderful intents now and 10 years from now they ignore all correspondence and communications from the town? So my question is, do we have a strong enforcement clause in this restriction? Mr. Moderator, I think the best person to answer that would be Town Council Paul Havity, who drafted this restriction with the Historical Commission. Uh, thank you, Mr. Moderator. Through you to the previous speaker. Uh, the town was limited in terms of what it could impose on this restriction. Of course, there is a private entity that is providing this restriction to the town. So there was a request um, to include a provision that would have allowed the town to take um, judicial action and have the property owner pay for the town's um, costs if they had to seek enforcement of this. Um, the property owner declined to include that as a provision. However, we still would have any provisions um, that are applicable in terms of the uh, enforcement of a restrictive covenant, and this is a restrictive covenant. There are statutes that apply that would allow for enforcement. Um, there are certain circumstances in which a, a party seeking to require enforcement can seek costs um, from the, uh, the breaching party, um, but we don't have anything specifically allowing that in the restriction. If, if I could have a follow-up question to that to town council through the town moderator. Sure. Um, what happens if we say no tonight? Does that give the town a stronger ability to renegotiate it, or does it just mean we lose all control on the preservation of that site? It, it, yes, if, we, if the town meeting says no tonight, it means that there'll be no restriction whatsoever on it. So basically, we're being asked to rubber stamp the preservation restriction, and we have no say in it. I, I, I don't know if that's a okay. question. Or <laughs> no, 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 but basically, it's either Vote yes for it and we get something, vote no and we get absolutely nothing. Is that correct? Those are the options that okay. are currently present. Thank you. All right. Anyone else? There being none, we'll vote on Article 9. Those who are familiar for, with that corner of town know that there is a uh, rather vast parking lot tucked behind the, uh, the, uh, the, the house on One Bill Rick Road and also the Santander Bank Branch. And uh, this concerns that. It appears from the town records that Santander Bank owns that entire property. So they are the owners with whom this is being discussed. Mm -hmm. 
The article passes 127 in favor, two opposed, four abstentions. Article 10. Article 10 is seeking an appropriation of $575,000 for the purchase of the 1.8 acre parcel of land located in the center in the parcel we just described for a municipal parking area. Um, <clears throat> It's, it, many of you are familiar with the site, but basically if the, in the center there is the um, parking area. Uh, the top left at the, the, the four corners, uh, you know, chicken corner in the center is the Fisk House. And then you have the Santander Bank, and then you have the Oddfellows parcel that's broken up. Um, the, obviously the parking area is in the uh, center lower portion of, of the property. It's been, it's been under a license agreement with the, the town for a dollar a year. Uh, terminable with a 30 days notice by the property owner. As I mentioned in the previous article, the property owner is liquidating the asset by, by selling the uh, lease and, and property under the Santander Bank branch, the property that's now being converted, the Oddfellows building into a restaurant and apartments above, and the Fisk House is, is on the market. And then the last piece, as you know, may recall, was an unsuccessful redevelopment of the property into multifamily uh, housing. Once that collapsed, uh, consulted with the select board, they authorized town council and me to pursue the uh, acquisition of that pro property so that we'd have parking in perpetuity in the town center because we know that parking is a premium, much like we have, we own a municipal parking lot in Vinyl Square. Um, we had a professional appraisal done for the property. That's how the appraisal came back. Uh, and we, we are purchasing it at that appraised price. Um, so that's what we were asking for your consideration and approval this evening. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee took no action on Article 10. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 10. Questions? Discussion? Paul Ragazio, uh, Precinct 2. Question, I have no objection with buying the property. I'm just talking about the financing. We're going to be increasing the, more, the debt of the town by 575000 and then having, a, what, a mortgage payment over the next 20, 25 years? We have a 10-year ten, oh, period, ten year, ten year period ten. that we, we'll, we'll, we'll pay that over. So our level principal, so we'll pay down 10% okay. of the principal every year and then the associated interest costs, which for a nonprofit right now is probably 3 to 4% interest. Yeah. Can't that money come out of the, the Community Preservation Act or the, where we bought the farmland in the past? Just, no, I don't believe the Community Preservation Act can be utilized to purchase a parking lot. Under the, it's not allowed under the provisions of the Okay, all right, thank Act. you. Thank you. Anyone else? Okay. Let's vote on Article 10 to uh, possibly buy a uh, parking lot. <laughs> I'm reminded of the Joni Mitchell song, Pay Paradise and Put Up a Parking Lot. Um, as was just pointed out, the the ability to have a substantial amount of parking right in the middle of town in perpetuity is very attractive, and I'm not surprised that the town meeting representatives are in favor of this particular article. It also abuts the uh, the brook Is that, that runs through town, and I know there's a master the plan for improving. The article passes 129 in favor, three opposed, no abstentions. Article 11. Mm -hmm. Article 11 is a request to obtain authorization to borrow $1.4 million for the reconstruction of the Chelmsford High School tennis and basketball courts and to convert a port of the McCarthy Tennis School courts into an additional parking area. This is the uh, aerial view of the high school tennis courts and the basketball courts and the street hockey court. Um, this, this item has been on the capital list uh, of, this, for funding for a number of years. It's to the point now, much like we had to come in and do the high school parking lot in portions, we're now at the point where we're at the end of the useful life of the high school tennis courts and basketball courts. In fact, in recent years, we really have had to struggle to make those outdoor courts playable by uh, CYBL for summertime operations. The other component of this is, was, is these are the uh, 
this is the existing McCarthy tennis courts behind the police station and um, at the McCarthy School track. And while we're doing this, the, the McCarthy tennis courts are in a state of disrepair. Um, the plan would be to remove the tennis courts and then of the $1.4 million, $200,000 would be used to extend the parking behind, uh, it, on the side of the police station, extend it straight back to the McCarthy School with a gate, much like you have an existing gate at the McCarthy School. So therefore, it's not used as a cut around for people to go from Old Westwood Road to avoid the rotary, but would, would provide a much needed parking for, for events that take place at the police station and or events that take place at the McCarthy School, such as Pop Warner and track meets and so forth. Some of you may have experienced that, unfortunately. Unfortunately, on voting day a couple weeks ago when there was a, a unscheduled move of the uh, of a track event at the time of the elections but parking is really condensed there for activities um, so at this point we're, we're finally getting around to the um, uh, uh, getting to the high school tennis courts and basketball and street hockey addressed and the courts at McCarthy were sort of the, were built as a result when Chelmsford High School was the McCarthy High School. As I said, they really have not been uh, maintained in recent years. Um, and, and at this point, the, if that were to be removed, what we would have would be the six courts at the high school, two courts at South Row School, and the court at Varney. We had a second uh, tennis court at Varney. We recently converted to pickleball, you may recall. And then the other thing that happened in the last couple of uh, several weeks is we've been approached by a par party who is interested in locating a pickleball court uh, in, in the community, indoor and outdoor site. And so we're, we're, we're exploring the possibility of possibly putting that at, at this site here at McCarthy. Um, so that's the plan under this article. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 11. Select Board have a recommendation. The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 11. Any discussion or questions? Hi, Christine McNamara, Precinct 8. Um, it's my understanding that the courts at McCarthy would be in use if they were playable. So that would mean the Chelmsford High School teams, both boys and girls, would be playing at both the high school and McCarthy. I have two kids that went through the system. They both played tennis. Okay. Are, always, uh, um, it, it, are you asking a question or are you? Oh, sorry. Sorry. So my question is, were the, was the high school tennis um, coach and staff uh, c considered uh, in proposing to uh, turn the tennis courts into parking lot? And well, um, one question at a time. So he can answer that first. Okay. Question, right, Ms. Marty, I'm going to invite Dr. Lang, Superintendent of Schools, and a former tennis coach, uh, to address this question. <laughs> wow. <laughs> it was a long, long time ago. Um, uh, can you ask your question one more time? So was the um, tennis program at the high school oh, I'm considered sorry. in this? proposal to re basically remove six of the courts in town, which is quite a few. Yeah, the, um, I did actually speak with the athletic director at the high school. The courts at McCarthy are unplayable. Um, right. They have not served as a uh, tennis venue for the high school team um, for quite some time. I recall, I mean, when I was actually in high school in the 80s, we played on those courts. That was the, um, the home court at the time. Um, I did actually coach the Chelmsford teams in the 90s, and um, we played a little bit at McCarthy until we were able to shift over to the high school when those new courts came online. Um, but as far back as even then, the primary courts for the high school would be the high, the high school itself. The boys and girls do play on a rotating basis, so if the boys are home, the girls are on the road, or if the girls are home, the boys are away. Um, so for a high school program, you typically don't need more than six courts. I'm not saying well, I did. I did actually contact the coach, hmm. and got a different answer. So um, that's why I bring it up. Um, so, if the boys have a home match, the girls don't have a place to play, because the courts at McCarthy are unplayable. Um, years ago, and I'm talking, you know, 2013, when my kids were going through, they still played at the McCarthy, and the boys and the girls. Um, rotated as to who was going to get the better courts at the high school, but they shifted, and, and those were in use then. And that wasn't that long ago, but it was out of necessity. 
Okay, do you have a question or are you, are you, are you in debate? I'm sorry, I don't know all the rules. Okay, I apologize. so if you have questions, it's better to ask your questions okay. now, and then if you have an argument, you can do it after. Okay, um, I guess I'm, I'm, my concern is um, if, if the uh, folks involved with the scheduling of the kids were consulted. Yeah, I consulted directly with the athletic director, uh, and the coaches would work for the athletic director. I did not speak with the coaches themselves. Right. Um, I'll tell you, I mean, any coach you asked, if you said, would you like to have two courts or 10 courts or 20 courts, they'd probably like to have 20 courts. Um, you know, the more the Well, more courts, it's, the it, more. there's a resource that hasn't been maintained in town and right. would like to see that resource maintained rather than uh, removed. Uh, Joe Reddy, Precinct 8. I'd like to uh, make an amendment to the article. Um, I'd like to remove the language in regards to and for the uh, conversion of the McCarthy School tennis courts into additional parking area. I'd like to modify the funding from 1.4 million to 1.2 million. Um, I had reached out to the town manager previously and discussed this um, in regards to the can amount you, that was can allocated. You, can you bring your motion here sure. so we can review it? Thank you. Your amendment. This is certainly a situation that's a tough one. Uh, it's, it's, it is definitely clear that big events at McCarthy need more parking. And the plan here was to take some derelict tennis courts and convert them into a parking lot. On the other hand, there's definitely a need for enough tennis courts, as you've heard, for our teams to play. <laughs> and of course, they, they play often uh, during the summer when there's no school, so it's not so much a problem then. The concentration of the voting precincts in three locations in town, that being here at the Senior Center, the McCarthy School, and the Town Hall, has, on Election Day in any case, made okay. the parking so much we more have, difficult we have an at amendment. McCarthy. Excuse me, just a point of information. Could someone explain what that line is? It goes through the tennis courts and up and around? Sure. That's just a property line from the GIS system. That's not, Excuse me? Yeah, that, that's just a, a line that comes from the properties that comprise the high school. There's nothing significant with that line. So, I mean, we own... We own the entire parcels, yeah. Yep. Okay, thank you. Okay, so we do have an amendment, <clears throat> and the amendment seeks to strike the words, and for the conversion of the McCarthy School tennis uh, courts into additional parking area, one hundred and uh, $1.4 million, and by substituting the words $1.2 million, uh, dollars, which apparently is the cost of doing the high school tennis courts, but not the McCarthy, right? Correct. Okay. So I propose this uh, amendment to the article. When I first saw the article, um, I became completely conflicted because I consider these to be both two community features which I think are important. And not everyone in the community plays tennis. I'm a big fan of tennis, I love tennis. I've used these courts over the years. I was on the tennis team when I was in high school. We ran into conflicts all the time with the girls tennis team when we were trying to practice. We may not have used it as our home courts, uh, but under Mark Branco we would uh, you know, utilize those courts. And I've tried to utilize those courts uh, in, in recent years, unfortunately, with the fencing and everything that's happened with it, uh, it's really become unplayable. No different than I've got four kids, they have a game at home, they lose all the pieces, next thing you know, the game really doesn't become as fun or as usable. So, uh, listen, I, um, I recognize that things change and that you need to, um, you know, be open to maybe new ideas. The town manager has suggested that there may be somebody interested in doing a pickleball center there, maybe donating some money. Um, I asked about, you know, if there's a specific plan as to how they're going to develop the parking there. Uh, there hasn't been a very specific plan developed yet. So really all I'm asking for is to take the portion of eliminating a, compu a community feature off of the table. Let's bring that back at a later date where we can discuss maybe a hybrid plan of saving a couple of courts. Maybe we eliminate all the courts or maybe we bring in pickleball or maybe we do something with it but I'd like to see it as a town meeting member with a definitive plan 
that shows, okay, here's the community benefit of X parking spaces versus having these courts. Allow the community to really discuss whether tennis is important as a feature. Uh, and somebody that pays attention a lot, I mean, this came onto my radar very late. Uh, and again, I can't pay attention to every meeting, but when it did come onto my radar, I said, you know what, I think it's worth taking a pause. Let's really discuss what we can do with this so that we don't lose a community feature we can't get back. And so I ask you to uh, support this amendment. Uh, it's very important to me. Thank you. Thank you. Scott Davidson, Precinct 3. Uh, I'm speaking, you can start the clock. I'm speaking out against this amendment. Uh, this was the first, uh, a couple of weeks ago, was the first opportunity for residents of my precinct to vote at McCarthy. Um, the experience was not a pleasant one. I heard from many of my constituents, and I had a bad experience myself. It started, first off, with there being absolutely no parking where the precinct three voters were supposed to vote in the small gym. Now, I know there was a conflict with the, the school department, but wouldn't it be wonderful if we had a parking lot that could handle multiple events going on at the same time. And I know voting only happens a few times a year, but there are many, many other events that go on in McCarthy where the parking is just horrible. If you ever have to drive through the McCarthy parking lot on a Sunday in the fall during Pop Warner when there are home games, cars are just parked everywhere. They're parked everywhere. It's impossible to get through. If you're there when there's an activity going on in the auditorium, cars park everywhere. So I get it, people like tennis. There are a lot of places to play tennis in town and maybe there should be more places to play tennis in town. But I don't think we're gonna miss having the tennis courts at the McCarthy Middle School when there is a desperate need for there to be more parking. Thank you. Thank you. Brian Latina, Precinct 9. Um, Back in the day, I actually ran the indoor tennis courts at Hanscom Air Force Base. Are and you? Are you? Tennis. I'm. I'm in debate, sir. Thank you. And tennis. Tennis is one of those sports that is um, arguably for higher echelon um, learning, teamwork, and it allows you to do it with just a couple of people later in life. Hate to think about trying to start to learn how to play tennis in high school. Um, we've got a nice little tennis court there. It's got six, six courts. I went there today. Um, you can put 15 parking spaces without going through the fence to the tennis courts at the police station if you really wanted to. I keep hearing people talking about green energy and stuff. Why in the world would we pay for more parking? Um, for the few times that we need to park, um, I don't know if anybody's gone to the ice cream place up the road here in, the, in Westford. They park on the lawn. It's very green. Most of the time, nobody's parked on it. And the few times, you know, we are at McCarthy where you need to park, let's, let's look at taking down the granite curbs and letting people park off the side in a safe way. The second part of that is that in my walk around the police station, there were two cars in the lot, so it's not always full all the time. The spaces could be smaller. We're going to smaller vehicles, electric and all the rest. Um, less asphalt is good, I'm told. Maybe we should, we should look at that $200,000 and put it onto the surface of that court while we have experts that are doing a tennis court. It's, very, it's a very specific um, expertise, and if you hire them to come back later at a future date, it'll cost you a lot more. It'd be real nice to get these courts all done up properly on one pass. And then finally, if you really need parking at the uh, police station, I, I propose to uh, Mr. Mr. Persichetti that we put a gate between the police station and the McCarthy School that provides about 15 spaces parked where the buses are when the school's not in session. So you can park and go to the training station without having to walk up the road by simply putting a, I called it the Gary Gate um, there. And if you really needed to, you could lock it when you didn't want people coming into the police station. So One there's minute. a couple of free, free approaches to it. Um, I would rather see tennis being taught from, from the bottom up rather than walking in and trying to compete with other high schools when you're learning as a freshman. It just won't work. So let's, let's defeat this amendment, put the $20,000 or whatever it is back in, surface the court and whatever, whatever that money will do, 
and continue on the meeting. Thank you. Okay, Mr. Latina, you you cannot change the purpose of the 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 paving. In other words, I understand what you're asking for, but the the article is limited to paving a parking lot and the tennis courts. We cannot change that to tennis courts and tennis courts. So I, I want you to well, be aware th of that. There's, if I understood it, there's a, an amendment before us right now. That's, that's really, I should have probably stopped at that. However, pavement is pavement, whether you spend it or not. We have before us a uh, after, right, right. The, the, article, the amendment uh, is, is basically... $1.4 million, I think, is the number. 1.2. 1.2. Just to we're just, do the tennis courts at the high school and not to do anything with the tennis courts in the, in the, um, in, in the, uh, in the McCarthy. I, I, I may have heard something different Wednesday night. Okay, okay. well, I'm, I, I just want to make sure that you understand. John Fall, Precinct 7. Uh, as a member of the Board of Registrars, I would also like to speak out against uh, this amendment. Um, we desperately need parking on election days, and also uh, during other times when there are meetings at the uh, uh, Chelmsford Police Station community room. Uh, many times you see people park down on Old North Road, and I think this, these parking spaces are sorely needed. So I speak out against that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Chris Garrett, Hand, Precinct 3, I'd like to speak in support of the amendment. Um, this has uh, in the past been a very good recreational opportunity for the young people and actually all ages of the community. And so once it's converted to, um, you know, to uh, hard top parking, you're going to lose that forever. So I mean, I'd like to see some flexibility here, take another look. Pickleball is becoming very popular throughout the country, really. Uh, so there may be a, a possibility to convert a court to a pickleball. You might want to still have a, at least a couple of tennis courts at this location. And also I've seen places that have converted one tennis court to a basketball court. So you can really cover uh, you know, a lot of recreational opportunities. I, I, I support the amendment. Thank you very much, sir. Thank you. Alvin Drayman, Precinct 7. Uh, would it be possible to put the map of that uh, map back up, please. Uh, the high school section, please. Okay. Now, as you said, that line actually means nothing. I do not know the terrain well there, but is it possible to have more than six tennis courts in that area? The answer for the train may be yes or no. Yes, you know, I mean, the terrain would allow additional surface uh, beyond what you see there, whether it be for a skateboard park or for additional tennis courts or what have you, yes. Go, going out, yeah, you gotta go out. You, 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 there's, a, there's a hill on the right side that you can't go to the right, you, you can only go out towards, towards the highway. So it would be up towards the top, you could go that way. What is the urgency on getting this done? Would, if there is a superior, if, if there is a possible superior way to get eight, eight or more tennis courts in that area, would it make, would it be reasonable to postpone this project to get it re redone so that the tennis courts would all be over there and then the other spot could be used however? There is some urgency. We, we wouldn't begin this work till the end of the summer because we don't want to conflict with the uh, CYBL or outdoor activities of the youth. So this probably would take place um, in, in, you know, probably around Labor Day and try to do our best in the fall and so forth. If, it's, if this gets deferred and pushed at fall town meeting, you're gonna, we're going to run into the same problem next summer. So you, you would basically be trying to extend the life of, of, of this facility here for two additional seasons. 
Um, and the other problem is, is your price increases are just ridiculous now for bidding anything. So that 1.2 million could go up 10% um, or who knows what it's going to be, the, the bidding market that's out there now. So those are the risk, the downside risk of waiting. Um, and then I, I, got, I guess that also assumes that the town would want to build 12 tennis courts in, in one complex at the high school, um, which again is sort of restricted to the public um, during school hours. I was just asking questions, tossing it out. If others want to make a motion, that, I'll thank leave it at that. Okay, thank you. Not being a tennis player myself. <laughs> Claire to not precinct four. Um, I want to thank Joe for putting this amendment forward, and I most heartily support it. I think that um, you know the town is always celebrating any opportunity to retain or add recreation spaces. And all I have going through the back of my mind right now is that old song, Paved Paradise, put up a parking lot. We can certainly wait a year. I think when you have a number of people standing in line like this, it says, well, this might have seemed like a good idea, but it can wait. Do I care about voting? Absolutely, always do, always vote. It was a little harder to get in the precinct seven, eight, old precinct 7 8 side of McCarthy this year but there were a lot of things going on at the school and maybe some greater you know that whole parking lot was filled up on that side because of something going on at the track it was very congested maybe some more planning about scheduling of events on election days could be done in the future we always know when the elections are it wasn't a special election and you know you couldn't park there easily, but it was fine to go around and park on the other side of the building. So it was doable. I wouldn't want to hurry up and get rid of a recreational space without understanding what the kids or the seniors or pickleball or whatever people want. You don't grow new land. So I would hope we could accept this motion and put the 200000 away and think more about what should be there. Thank you. Thank you. Paul Regazio, Precinct 2. I'm in favor of this amendment. I think these are two separate projects. We'll probably involve two separate contracts if we go forward two different contracting firms. So let's do the one. Let's spend that time fixing the, the tennis courts, basketball courts at the high school, and let's postpone the, uh, the McCarthy change, and maybe there's some other opportunity with the pickleball. So let's be in favor of this amendment. Thank you. Thank you. Donna Reddy, whoop, <laughs> Donna Reddy, uh, Precinct 11. Um, I, I am in favor of this amendment. I am a lifelong tennis player. I still play twice a week. Um, I especially love to play outdoors, and I wish we had more facilities in town. But um, I, I think it's sad that we have allowed the McCarthy tennis courts to get in the disrepair that they are in. Uh, but if we are considering what we're going to do with it and we're spending, you're thinking of spending all this money to pave it, why are we not resurfacing these and getting them back into uh, playable condition? It seems to me it would be about the same amount of money. But even if um, we, no matter what is planned, I don't think anything has been thought out long enough on this particular, on the McCarthy fields, the McCarthy courts, for us to make a decision tonight. I'd like to see the high school ones taken care of, and then I'd like to bring it back to town meeting and think of other ways that we might want to use this. It could be for pickleball, it could be for fixing the courts, maybe part of it we could give to some parking. Uh, but I, I agree with Claire, uh, I don't think we should pave paradise to put up a parking lot. So uh, I am in favor of this um, article and I, uh, this amendment. And uh, as far as the uh, parking for um, the uh, elections, if we moved elections to a Saturday, uh, there wouldn't be as many parking issues. The school would not be in session. So uh, things can be worked out as far as scheduling is concerned. Thank you. Joe Reddy, Precinct 8. Uh, just to reiterate, my intent for this is so that the town can come back with a more definitive plan as to what they want to do. Uh, and maybe that includes relocating court somewhere. Maybe that includes just doing all parking. But it, it is not conflicting with 
resurfacing of the high school courts, which I think are much needed. And I don't want to be in a position where I feel like I'm destroying a community feature while trying to save a community feature. I want to be voting on a feel-good article that's to save a community feature, and we can discuss the future impact of what this is going to be at a later date when there's just a better plan in place. That's how I see it. Thank you. Thank you. Ken Lefebvre, Precinct 6, no, six and uh, Vice Chair of the Select Board. When this was presented to the Select Board, I voted in favor of this article. But after receiving a few phone calls and, and listening to the way it's been presented tonight for this amendment, um, I would agree that it's probably two separate issues and we're not asking, or this amendment's not asking that you unfund the 1.2 million for the schools. It's just asking that we use the 200 uh, for McCarthy and sort of take a better look at it. So I would vote to support this amendment. Thank you. I just wanted to follow up, Christine McNamara, Precinct 8, that I am in support of your amendment, and I'd written a similar one. Uh, so um, I'd like to see that go ahead, and I'm in support of uh, taking care of the facility over at the high school, which is in desperate need of attention. And I would um, also mention that it's not so much a coach's dream to have more courts all the time. It's you know, it's it's more a function of the way they do their schedules and and parity for all the teams to be able to practice. So if it were playable, they would be using it. It was very loud and clear from the coach at the high school. Thank you. Thank you. Amanda Collison, Precinct 2. Um, how many parking spots would be added if that uh, the, the courts at McCarthy ends up being paved? What was the number again? Right. The plan is 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 to only construct parking basically to where the parallel to the existing um, police station parking lot towards towards McCarthy. So basically, you, almost where those two lower tennis courts would be. That's roughly about 35 parking spaces would be available there, and then the remaining area would, would be would would not be um, would not be parking lot. It would be a um, remove the surface and then just leave it as grass, what have you. And as we said, we also explored the possibility of, of a pickleball facility by a private charitable foundation that's reached out to us. The only other possibility could be that if you did remove those two lower areas for the parking lot, you could probably replicate those if you wanted to keep six tennis courts there where the skateboard park is, and then have your six there if that was to be desired in the future by the community. And then uh, relocate the skateboard park over by at the high school or another location. So as you said, there are different possibilities of what can be done there. But to answer your question is it's just to run the parking lot at the police station parallel straight down to McCarthy, about 35 to 40 spaces. Okay, you can start the clock. Um, then given the small number of parking spaces that would actually be added and the fact that the rest of it would just become grass, I am in agreement with the amendment that I don't think it's uh, the right time to turn those, uh, while unusable, um, turn those into parking. Thank you. <laughs> Eric Cunningham, Precinct 9. I actually have a question. Uh, I think we've, I feel like we've debated this enough. Um, these seem like two unrelated issues. So by adding the $200,000 to make parking, was that a reaction to the voting and the, un, the, you know, the unplayable nature of this? or is there uh, some sort of economic advantage to spending the money together? Like, are we gonna shortchange ourselves later on by not spending the 200 today? Right, let, let me make clear, the capital planning consideration was done back last November and December, so that was well before the voting in April, yep. when this plan was, okay. was, was presented by the capital planning committee, that was examined by the school committee, and then it was presented to the finance committee uh, in February, March timeframe, and then the select board uh, in, in April, earlier this month. Um, so again, it wasn't a, it wasn't a last-minute consideration. Basically, it was a consideration of addressing the parking the, of the tennis courts, you know, at McCarthy and the high school. And quite frankly, it never occurred to us to ask for pro approaching two million dollars to do tennis courts in the community. Right. And, and and I and it was sort of seen that way of like, well, what do we do? Because the, the ones at McCarthy are, are in disrepair, um, and therefore the solution was let's redo the ones at the high school and then, uh, you know, eliminate the McCarthy. Um, courts. Um, so that was that was the vision at the time. And okay. 
Yeah, I guess the, I, I think that answers the question and, and it goes to the longer term question that I, I think I'm leaning towards deferring to would be if, what's the cost to repair them if we're gonna keep it? Like you're gonna come back to another million dollars because um, I might question that. Well, again, the, the, the high school tennis courts have to be reconstructed. They're newer than the ones at McCarthy. Okay. So the, if we're going to have to redo the ones at McCarthy, it's a total reconstruction. Okay. Obviously, the area isn't as big as the one at the high school, but my guess is you're probably talking, I'm sorry, you're probably talking $600,000 is what, is, what is, is my sense in, in consulting with the DPW director to do that additional work at McCarthy. Um, so again, it's, it's, it's you know, we, 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 we're mindful that we got a lot of capital needs and that was sort of the genesis behind it of just asking for the 1.2 plus the two okay. as opposed to the other approach. I, that answers my question, thanks. Thank you. I would like to move the question, please. Paul Ragazio, precinct two, move the question. We have a motion to move the question. What that means is that there will, uh, if, if uh, town meeting votes to uh, accept this motion, approve it. Uh, all debate on this amendment will cease and we will vote on the amendment. So, uh, Ted, are we close to doing a motion to move? Okay, so a yes vote means that we will no longer engage in any further discussion on the amendment and then our next order of business would be to vote on the amendment. A no vote means that we can continue to discuss the amendment. And it looks like this amendment is going to pass handily uh, proposed by uh, uh, the, uh, the Reddys and I, Joe Reddy. And uh, it looks like um, the tennis courts of McCarthy may live to see another day. The uh, motion to amend passes 120 in moved, I'm sorry, the, to move the question. That passed, so now we get to the amendment and uh, we're voting on that. And that's a simple as well. And I apologize, I misspoke there. That was just on the article, the, the motion to end debate. So now this is the actual right. vote. This, this reduces the, the amount that we would be funding to 1.2 from 1.4. And this would just involve uh, constructing high school tennis courts and nothing on the McCarthy property. And this does require a two thirds vote. And it does look like that two thirds is handily reached. So the upshot is that the tennis courts at the high school will be repaired with $1.2 million and the ones at McCarthy will stay status quo for the time being until a better plan is brought forward for town meeting. Right, you're right. Okay, I'm sorry. So the, mo the motion to amend the article has passed. 118 in favor, six opposed, five abstentions. Now we vote on the article for the 1.2. It might seem like a tedious process, but it allows no, the uh, adequate debate. And uh, you know, the process of making an amendment here at town meeting is what? actually a pretty involved one. Oh, does anybody want to discuss the main? Oh, I'm sorry. I, th I thought I thought the discussion was pretty much gone on this. Go ahead. I'm sorry. Uh, Johanna Shaw, Precinct Nine. Um, first, I'm, I'm glad we put through the amendment because that at least cuts down on what I feel like is a possibly rushed design and we're not necessarily considering all of our options. Um, I'd also like to see the, um, the article as a whole not pass and I'd like to see us assess whether moving maybe those six courts to the high school could be better or there's a lot of open space you can see in the back of that map. Um, or like at the top of the screen behind the tennis courts, and we might be able to use that better. I feel like we could look at where we might be able to put things like if we w preferred to have tennis courts at McCarthy, like uh, Mr. Cohen had mentioned, um, if we wanted to then move the skate park to do that, there's space there that maybe it could go to. I think there's a lot of options that we're not considering, and I would rather see us 
in order to do this in a timely manner, call a special town meeting to approve a more well thought out plan down the road, then see us push through just putting what's there back in the same footprint um, instead of considering all the options. Thank you. Any more discussion on the, the article as amended? Hi, I just had a question whether the reconstruction of that site would include um, windscreens as part of the uh, design or um, possible plantings that would create a wind barrier because it's a very windy area because um, it's so open. Yes, that has been discussed uh, um, with the athletic director as well, um, and it would be something at least on the, on the one side, which would be behind the basketball courts to help out with that. Yep. Thank you. Any more questions? Any more debate? There being none, we're finally going to vote on <laughs> Article 11. As amended, this does require a two-thirds vote. It's interesting that every town meeting, it seems, there's one article that is the speed bump that uh, kind of slows everything down. This is essentially a capital budget item uh, that was not included within the main capital budget, this re <coughs> refurbishment of the tennis courts and, and the parking at McCarthy. Um, and it, it drew a lot of attention, as you can see. The article passes 121 in favor, no uh, nine uh, negative votes, and uh, two abstentions. Article 12 has been withdrawn by the proponent, and Article 13, 14, 15, 16, 17, 18, 19, 20, 21, and 22, and 23 have been the consent agenda. So we will now go to Article 24. Okay. Article 24 is the beginning of the Community Preservation Fund considerations. Bus. The first article, as always at Spring Town Meeting, is to deal with the existing debt service for the Community Preservation Fund, the $50,000 in administrative expenses for the Community Preservation Committee, and the required reserves to meet the 10% uh, requirement. Uh, we're projecting to take in $1.36 million in Community Preservation Fund surcharge. Uh, we expect a state match of 425000 for a total of $1.785 million for the upcoming fiscal year. We put the 10 percent we're required in each of the allocations, so we push towards the debt service, so that way we have maximum flexibility with the use of the Community Preservation Fund um, on designated reserves. This is the existing debt service for the projects that we're paying for. It's, as you can see, it totals $496,000. Um, $422, uh, and basically you can see that you know, we're, this will be the final year to pay off the debt for Sheehan Farm, and then we're, you can see we're nearing the end at Varney Playground and so forth, and then again we pay level principal, so every year it doesn't, it's not the same amount of drops because we pay a portion of the principal every year. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 24. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 24. Any discussion or debate? There being none, we will vote on the uh, uh, Community Preservation uh, Article appro appropriating uh, $61,421 for debt service, $50,000 for administrative expenses, $145,000 for the three areas of open space, historic preservation and community housing, and 250000 for budgeted reserves. The next sequence of articles will we'll discuss ways to spend these community preservation funds that have been accumulating every time a property is sold in town, a fraction goes into this pot of money that's used for community improvements. We this heard is unanimously 121 mentioned, in mentioned favor, earlier that it no can't be used for a parking lot. 
but it can be used for playgrounds and lots and of other Martin, things, Art as you'll hear. Article 25 is the first of new community preservation projects. We're starting with a series of playground projects. The first one is a transfer of $200,000 from the Community Preservation Fund General Reserve for the purchase and installation of new playground equipment at Varney Playground. Um, as you know, in the past, we were at Fall Town Meeting, the playground equipment was constructed over 20 years ago. It's of wood construction, and at the end of its useful life, the new playground equipment area will be ADA compliant to provide accessibility for all children. Um, we, again, appropriated 285. Now we need an additional $200,000 to complete the project in terms of funding additional equipment along with site drainage, grading improvements, and perimeter fencing to make it a fully accessible playground. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. The Finance Committee have a recommendation. The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 25. Select Board have a recommendation. The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 25. Any discussion? Uh, Phil Stanway, uh, number five. Um, uh, just a discussion. What I would like to say is that uh, at Varney, when we invested a lot of money, we were supposed to uh, mitigate the water problem, and it didn't. It made it worse. So I'm hoping um, that this time that they do take care of the problem, because at this point, we cannot even turn those beaches or clean them, because the drainage is so bad. So with this being ADA, which means more runoff, uh, I do hope that they finally address the problem and that the beach doesn't wash out. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? There being none, <clears throat> voting uh, on Article 25, uh, appropriating $200,000 from Community Preservation Fund General Reserve for the purchase and installation of playground equipment at Varney Playground. Article passes 127 in favor, three in op uh, opposition, one abstention. Article 26. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Article 6 is to uh, basically replace the existing playground at the C Center Elementary School. We're seeking an $82,000 transfer from the Community Preservation Fund General Reserve. Uh, this is an illustration of what the playground will look like when it's completed. You may recall we've done recent playgrounds at the other schools, Harrington, Byam, and so forth. This is the last one that we're doing. The existing playground equipment at Center School is over 20 years old. The school department will be contributing $138,000 funding towards this, and the Center School PTO has done fundraising for $50,000 for this $270,000 project. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the uh, Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 26. Select Board have a recommendation. The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 26. Any discussion or debate? Questions? Um, question, Badru uh, Pliop uh, and Precinct 11. Um, what's the expected lifetime for this uh, equipment? It's at least 20 years old, right? 20 years, the new, new equipment's at least 20 years, yeah. It's a, yeah, it's at least got a shelf life of at least 20 plus years. Yeah. Um, can you tell me what, if you are aware of or if you have a model based on all the types of um, purchases that you do for these kind of equipment, what's the annual inflation rate for replacement? So what would it cost us in 20 years to replace this? I have no idea. All I know is that we, 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 are tr we, we saw a price increase by the manufacturers of what, 5% this spring, a little more than that. And I can't tell you what inflation is going to be over the next 20 years. I'm, I'm, I'm worried about the next 20 months. Uh, but I have no idea, Padre. I have no idea what it's going to cost in 20 plus years. No, no guesstimates as to what the range would be based on what we bought this uh, the question, ago? The question has been asked and answered. I mean, okay. really, 20 years? OK. Thank you. <coughs> Mr. Moderator, Ginger Scoob, 
4 Dalton Road, Precinct 5. Um, you can start the clock. Um, just, I wasn't going to speak because it seemed like we were kind of a done deal, but with the any sort of objection, I want to make sure that somebody from the PTOs gets up and talks. Um, the uh, town manager mentioned that we have been replacing the playgrounds at um, all of our other schools. A lot of that was done with the um, addition of the pods at the schools for additional classrooms. At center school, that wasn't a possibility um, because of the wetlands that abut that area uh, and there are significant drainage issues. Um, so when the pods were put in, um, the playground there was not able to be redone uh, without a significant cost. So uh, the center school um, at PTO, uh, did a lot of work over the last five years to do a significant amount of um, fundraising and we've had a wonderful windfall this past year as part of the funding from um, the federal government. Uh, and so this is kind of a one-time opportunity and as you heard from the town manager, the uh, prices continue to go up on these things. The structure that is at Center School right now is nearly unusable. It is not accessible ADA for um, our, a lot of our students. Um, and it has been, we've been using stop gaps. And in fact, for most of the pandemic, the playground was not actually able to be used at all because of the drainage issues. So I, while I understand the um, previous speakers or the previous commenters um, concerns about longevity and things, right now center school uh, is at risk of having no playground. And in fact, not just no playground, no field space um, because this reconstruction would also include a redo of their hot tops and their basketball court areas, uh, which right now are, are unusable. So I would ask, please, um, the PTOs have done a lot of work to try and help defer some of this cost. The school committee has done their job. Um, we just need that small bump from the, from the town, which I know is not small, but to allow these kids to have a playground that is usable at all. Thank you. Thank you. There being no one else, we will vote on Article 26 to fund a playground for the Center Elementary <coughs> School. Okay, the article passes unanimously, 130 in favor, no opposition or abstentions. Article 27. Yeah, article 27 is to transfer $135,000 from the Community Preservation Fund General Reserve for the purchase and installation of an outdoor fitness equipment at the town-owned land located at the corner of Wilson Street and Chelmsford Street. Uh, obviously, Wilson Street runs left to right on the bottom. Chelmsford Street runs top, top to bottom. Um, we we uh, pursuing and have obtained a fifty thousand dollar grant from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts to to offset a portion of the construction of this facility. The idea of the of the adult or the outdoor fitness park is to provide a seven minute workout. Um, and and speaking to Blue Cross in, in the programs that run this, they wanted in a in a visible and a high trafficked area. And we we basically looked at this area because it's near the Bruce Freeman Rail Trail as well as the volume of activity that goes down Chelmsford and Wilson Street. There's ample parking there by the Housing Authority lot there. And in terms of the baseball field, which is used by, by, by young uh, softball players, you can see the shallow d depth of, of, right, of right field uh, at Chelmsford Street. Clearly, this is even beyond that area in left field. And balls rarely leave the infield for the kids who are playing on that field, because um, really, the real serious activity takes place over at Southwell. Um, the 
this is the appearance of the uh, outdoor facility, fitness court. Um, it hit, this was, as you can see on the slide, it, was, it, it opened in June of 2019 in the town of Burlington. Uh, and it, it has this, this instructions of, you know, for, for a seven minute workout. And again, it's 30 pieces of, of body weight equipment to allow people of all ages and ability levels. And again, the cost of this will be offset by a $50,000 grant that's been committed from Blue Cross Blue Shield of Massachusetts and National Fitness, who installed these facilities in other areas of the state uh, and in the country. Uh, such as, th thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? He recommends approval of Article 27. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 27. Any discussion or debate? Scott Davidson, Precinct 3. Uh, just a couple of questions I just want a clarification on. So um, people will be able to use the facilities, the equipment, while softball is going on? Yes. That's fine. Yeah, there's, there's no be no interference from the softball activities. Okay, and then we're getting a fifty thousand dollar grant from Blue Cross, so the total cost will be one hundred and eighty five thousand for yes. everything. Yes. Okay, and then will there be any lighting around it so that people might be able to use it at night, I, th which I am hoping there won't be. But, no, there's no okay. plans to install night lighting. We don't want it to have that kind of activity. Great. Kids Thank you. Around at night. Alvin Draymond, Precinct 7. Uh, just a, a question, has anyone done any study or paid attention to, are people in Burlington actually using the facility there? Yes, not only in Burlington, but th this, is, this, is, this is sort of spread across the country from west to east, and they're now, in, and they're now utilized in this part of the country, but th they've, they've existed in, in from California all the way across the country, and in Tewksbury and other locations, and so forth, they are utilized. And, and um, they, again, the Blue Cross Blue Shield has, has, has agreed to sponsor 20 of these across the Commonwealth this year because of the acceptance and growing popularity of these these, these outdoor fitness parks. Okay, I just I've never seen them used, and I'm just curious if they were. <laughs> Thank you. Hi, Liz Reinowich, Precinct 11. I was going to ask the same question about, um, you know, has anyone visited the Burlington site and, you know, does it seem like something uh, people would want to use? I mean, I, we hear it's going across the country coming from the west, but for our town, who, uh, is it mainly for the kids to do their sports stuff? No. You want to do it? All right. This, this is the playground for adults. Oh, okay. Okay, because we, I, I, I thought it seemed kind of cool. It looks really Art Deco, you know, kind of cool looking, and I thought it was neat. But then I asked my neighbors, or neighbors, and they're like, "Oh no, we, we wouldn't use that." And I said, "Strategically, it's near the rail trail. Will people go and use it?" And they said, "No, they have to walk across traffic." So my neighbors were like, "Oh, I don't think anyone would use that." And then when you think we have three gyms in town, so is everyone who wants to exercise already exercising? But if, if people think they're going to use it, that's, that's one thing. But with the uh, inflation and whatnot, you know, the cost of everything going up, is this where we want to spend our money? But so are you? <laughs> uh, well, OK, I, yeah, I'm still feeling fairly new at one of, uh, doing this. But yeah, so I would, I would think it's better to give the kids their playgrounds, but um, you know, let other people talk. OK, yeah. thank you. Sheila Pichette, Precinct 10. This looks really good, but I don't know what I'm looking at. I, 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 you know, I would get there and I would say to myself, uh, what is this and what do I do next? Are there real clear instructions as to what you're supposed to do? Yes, and that's sort of, the, that's where you can see sort of the markings on the wall. It sort of walks you through how to utilize the fitness park, yes. So this so would be just in the, I mean, when the snow comes, you can't use it, so it's mm -hmm. like, three seasons out of the year usage. Um, I, I, too, have a question about whether it will be used to the fullest extent for $135,000. But thank you for ask, answering my question. Thank you. Uh, Chris Oak, Precinct 6. Uh, Paul, I just had a question about um, 
liability for these. So if somebody utilizes this and hurts themselves or breaks their neck, is the town liable for that? No, it's no different than a skate park, skateboard okay. park, or other things. The town's not charging a fee for okay. lessons or utilization, and we're not giving instruction, so there's, there's no liability for the town. Okay, department. thank you. Glen Thorne, Precinct 7. Uh, you can start the clock. I won't be that long. Uh, yes, people will use this. This has been on the West Coast for 30 years. And for those of you who are lucky enough to take business travel onto the West Coast and go by facilities where these are located, Lockheed had two of these in their facility on the West Coast and other business areas. Yeah, people all ages use this from, I don't know, six years old or people older than I am. So if it's there, the people will come. Uh, and 30 years ago, 20 years ago, these places weren't, you know, you didn't see 100 people there, but there was always a half a dozen people there almost any time of the daylight hours, you know, using the exercise equipment. I think it'll be a great addition to the town. We've got a grant. Uh, anything to improve the fitness of any town is the right thing to do. Thank you. Ruth Monahan, Precinct 3A, West Chelmsford. If you build it, I will come. Mike Tully, Precinct 5, um, is there any um, construction you going to do with the rail trail to make it more accessible, or do you have to walk down to the lights where the baseball field is and then walk back up? Yeah, there, there, you would have to, you'd have to cross by, the, by, Fletcher, you know, by, yeah, by Fletcher Street to, to cross the, the, the rail trail there. We're, we're not going to, for somebody who's on the rail trail, I mean, obviously if somebody's coming from a different direction, you could park or you could walk if you're coming from the center and so forth, but... But no, we're not going to add another cross, signalized cross thing or anything on Chelmsford Street. OK. Thank you. Helen Blasioli, Precinct 2. Anytime I can get up and tell Paul he's wrong, I love it. I want you to know that it's not from the west to the east coast in the United States of America. It's all over the world and has been for many years. When I was in Australia, New Zealand, they were mobbed. I think we need to do something for everybody. This town is just, it doesn't, it doesn't work anymore. Let's make it work. Thank you. I just have a question. Um, is it in the historic district? And is there any, um, no, OK. No. Thank you. Kevin Reddy, Precinct what, uh, 8. <laughs> um, question on the. I guess the, the corporate logos, will, will ours have that? We're exploring it. Uh, Lisa Maroney, our business development director, has had conversations with Lowell General Hospital. As you can see, Leahy Hospital sponsored the one in the portion of the cost in Burlington. So we're looking to see if that, that, that could be possible. Uh, if that were the case, then we would expend less and then turn the money back to the, the Community Preservation Fund. So, but we, right at this point, we don't have any commitments. So right now, there's no commitment to put any sort of logos, no, but right, exactly. who would make the decision on adding a logo in the future? Basically, if we, receive, if we receive a grant, it would go to the select board for approval to accept the gift, and then they would basically show, well, what's the logo, what's the design of that? Uh, that's, how a, that's how a gift process works to the town. Right, perfect, thank you. Thank you. Padre Upliapan, Precinct 11. Will there be uh, any bike racks in the area when people supposedly come from the tr bike trail and do their seven minute exercise and then an extra 10 minutes to cool down? Will there be enough bike racks to support? Yes, we, we, are, we would install bike racks because you just said we're, we're hoping to get people off of the rail trail. Yes. Okay, thank you. Thank you. David Drayton, uh, Precinct 5B. I just have a question. I'm curious who's going to be selecting the specific equipment that's installed in here and whether the, uh, the residents will have an opportunity to provide feedback on it. It's a standard equipment package um, in terms of, you know, so it's, there really are no selections. It's a standard workout that's, that's been designed and, and, you know, boilerplate template for what they use. So we really don't have a selection committee for equipment. It's, it's pretty much what you see is what you get in terms of the, the different types of aerobic and other activities that are there. So there really isn't, it's not like we're you know, adding pieces or selecting pieces to this project. Okay, thanks. Thank you. One more question, Paul. Um, Badriu Klippen, Precinct 11. Um, what's the maintenance requirement on this, if at all? 
very little maintenance. In fact, part of the agreement with, with the, comp the corporation that sells this is, you know, they, they do assist the town in, in routine maintenance, but there really isn't significant maintenance to this facility, much like we have some fitness stations at Roberts Field and other areas. So that's not a considerable cost going forward. And I'll ask this question again. What's the expected lifetime of the first set of equipment? Yeah, I, and, yeah, and I, I only ask this, I I would, I'll, I'll, tell, I'll tell the rationale as to why it is, because if we know the lifetime, we know what's a replacement cost based yeah. on inflation, what we are supposed to be due in X number of years. That's all I'm asking, what, what's the lifetime? Because we have to fund it at some point to replace it. It's concrete, and the base is, in my senses, is probably 15 to 20 years, Gary. Yeah, I would think that's about that. Yeah, about 20 plus. About 20 years. Thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Sue Carter, Precinct 11. Um, if we have these, did we have one of these or similar in par at Parker? And didn't we have like a, didn't they used to call them like a par course or something like that? Where you had different stations? And if we have them at other places in town, how much use are they getting? Because I'm not sure anybody remembers that we have them in other locations. We have three locations as it stands today. We have uh, Parker School, we have the McCarthy, and we have them at Roberts Field. Um, Roberts Field are uh, going to be complete soon. Uh, it was part of the remodel that just went there. They are used um, during the day by the students in both of the schools. And I know um, Parker especially, and I believe the same things happen at McCarthy. They're being used during uh, football season, especially when um, parents have the children that aren't playing out on the field for Pup Warner. They're usually enjoying themselves on that or the playground. Will Wagner, Precinct 3. Uh, just to address the question from the previous uh, questioner, uh, I live right down the road from Parker and I frequently walk by there after school hours and invariably there's at least one or two people using the equipment there. Thank you. Anyone else? There being none, we will vote on Article 27 for a uh, fitness center at Wilson and Chelmsford Street. The article passes 91 in favor, 35 opposed, no abstentions. Article 28. Okay, Article 28 is, is we're moving to HVAC projects to the Community Preservation Fund. The first one is a request to transfer $150,000 from the Community Preservation Fund General Reserve for the purchase and installation of enhancements to the HVAC system at the McKay Public Library. Um, the McKay Library, as you know, has been closed during COVID. Uh, it's a house that's, that's over 120 years old. It doesn't obviously meet current indoor air quality standards. The top floor of the building is non-handicapped accessible, and therefore, basically, we would install a new uh, ventilation system into the building, uh, and then the up upstairs non-handicapped accessible would be closed to the public. Um, so we're requesting the funding under this article. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? He unanimously recommends approval of Article 28. School, uh, the, the Select Board have a, a recommendation. The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 28. Any discussion? There being none, we will vote on Article 28. Transfer funds from the uh, Community Preservation Fund General Reserve for a HVAC at the McKay Public Library.
Article passes 120 in favor, four opposed, no abstentions. Article 29. Article 29 is to provide $74,900 on the Community Preservation Gen Fund General Reserve for the purchase and installation of HVAC systems at the North Town Hall. Uh, again, same situation, 100-year-old building. We are trying to achieve in compliance with current indoor air quality standards uh, by installing an energy recovery ventilation units um, and air balance the systems in the, in the facility. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously, unanimously recommends approval of Article 29. Does the Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 29. Discussion? Clitch, not Precinct 4. I have a general question on the way we present community preservation articles now. In days gone by, the chair of the Community Preservation Committee would stand up and give the body some information about the financial condition of Community Preservation Fund, what they had on each of the three buckets of money for affordable housing, historic preservation, and I, I'm uncomfortable. I know we have a committee, I'm trusting the you know, meeting and holding the best interests of town, at heart when they bring these articles forward, but I'm uncomfortable that we're not getting any sort of big picture overview of what's significant amounts of money year after year. And it, I, I, I want to know if it's possible for somebody to reach out to that committee or at least request the chair come and present some information to the body as a whole, because we're piecemealing our approvals here on faith and trust. Who would address that with the community preservation? How do we, is, how is, do I, if I'm standing here all alone? So that's a question to the presenter? Go about this. Yeah, yeah, Mr. Moderator, um, I attend the community preservation committees. Linda Prescott is a chair of the committee. We have representatives of the select board on the community preservation committee. Our public works director is on the committee. Our town accountant reports all the financials, and I've attended all their meetings. <clears throat> so Basically, if we no, just, maybe we need a city council, Paul. The town meeting representatives are here to represent the citizens, and we need to be informed. And what you're basically saying to me is all these bodies exist, and that's all you need. I'm done with my discussion, but I'd like to know. I'll call you tomorrow. I, I don't believe that was my answer. I'm sorry. I, don't, I, but I was trying to explain that the, these discussions do take place at the Community Preservation Committee. Um, and then basically, Linda Prescott hands it off to me to present at town meeting. This is not a venue that she's very comfortable with presenting. Uh, perhaps in the future, if a different member of the commission or committee wants to do it, I'm, I'm glad to step aside. But I, I'm not here trying to shortchange or prevent information from any, anyone. But I can just tell you that those questions are discussed and considered and reported by the town accountant and, and discussed by the committee when they pull the entire plan together at publicly posted meetings. And again, if there's questions that you have, uh, you know, we'll, do, we'll answer them this evening with members of the commission who are in the room. So. Mr. Moderator, through you to the town manager, uh, are the community preservation meetings uh, public attendance as well as publicly listed? Yes, they're publicly posted meetings. Okay. They usually then, meet the third then, Wednesday of every month. Then through you, Mr. Moderator, to the previous questioner and to anyone who was interested, as a town meeting rep, I suggest it is your responsibility to attend meetings of public committees which you feel are interest. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Moderator, Brian Latina, Precinct 9. I, I agree with the previous, previous speaker that when we have an article presented by the Community Preservation Committee, it should be presented by the Community Preservation Committee. You can run the clock. We, we keep doing this over and over again. There were some financial questions. The Financial Committee should have jumped up and, and answered some of the financial questions. Perhaps we should go to those meetings. We have hundreds of hours of meetings that we can't do. That's why we're all here tonight. So if there are questions, we should be able to answer the people that brought this to us, and they should be answered properly and to the extent that we can then properly vote for our precincts. Because this is a real tough one. 
its HVAC and its preservation. We did open space, preservation, and we did um, housing. That was what we started at. Now we can build soccer fields when it's open space. We can put a big um, athletic project in the middle of, of the kids' softball field on a corner that was kind of pretty. So we're changing how we're spending this money, and we're spending it awful quick. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else? All right. We're voting on uh, Article 29 to appropriate uh, $74,900 from community preservation for HVAC at the North Town Hall. Article passes 114 in favor, eight uh, opposed, and four abstentions. I think we have time for one more, Article 31, yeah, uh, Article 30. This is the final community preservation article. It's to transfer $144,450 from the Community Preservation Fund General Reserve to, for the purchase and enhancement of HVAC systems at the Center Town Hall. Uh, again, it's the same approach and rationale to, to address the uh, ventilation needs uh, of the building for its occupancy and usage. Finance Committee have a recommendation. The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 30. <laughs> select Board have a recommendation. The Select Board <coughs> unanimously recommends approval of Article 30. Discussion. Pam Armstrong, Precinct 1. Paul, after we've um, expended all this money from CBC, what's the balance in that account? Uh, tell me how our town accountant, Darlene Lucier, uh, addressed the question. She, she's the one who certifies and reports and was present when the discussion took place at Community Preservation. Um, I really haven't, I don't know what's going to be the balance after we do it, but we do have plenty of money in the um, undesignated fund balance. The, the current status of the account is, um, $2.8 million is in the undesignated fund balance. So there's plenty of funding for all of these projects to be covered under this unde unde undesignated fund balance. And there will also be additional monies that will close to that fund when I close out this account at the end of the fiscal year. Money will be closing back to the, un to the undesignated fund balance. And what is the benefit to not pay off some of the loans that we have against we, CBC, if we have that much money available? What we, what we do annually, and we just did in the um, article, the, I don't know what number article it was for CPC, is we take the 10%. So the 10%, we um, close those out to the 10% the buckets, and then those go to, to pay off any debt. So that's been the, um, that was voted on the way that, the, that CPC would handle paying off their debt. They would take the temper, whatever was in the 10 percents, and they would take those balances and pay off the debt. So right now there's really no money in those 10 percents because the money goes, we do like the, this year we're doing $140,000 in each one of those three buckets and they go right back out to pay the debt. So we, are we receiving a higher amount of interest in the money we're holding versus the amount we're paying in interest in the Correct. loans? Well, interest right now is, um, the, in the interest account, just to, to tell you where we are right now, um, this is really just through March, um, my numbers, but we've received revenue from the tax base is $955,000. We received $14,866 in interest, um, and we have a state match of your $540,000. Thank you. Anyone else? Again, in, uh, oh, Alvin Drimmon, Precinct 7. Another question, out of ignorance. Uh, what is this building primarily used for? 
the the That's center. That's the Center for the Arts. <laughs> oh, 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 oh! If I may, go I ahead. Withdraw the question. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Anyone else? Rod Cleese, Precinct 10. Uh, this may show my ignorance, <laughs> like my predecessor. <laughs> but I was under the impression this building was soon to be done with. Is this yes or no? Did I get poor information? I'm going to redraw my question. <laughs> Basically, real quick, I'll just because I didn't want to spend good money after bad, or you know. Uh, uh, a selection committee consisted of myself, two members of the, of the select board, uh, the chair of the CCA advisory committee, and the executive director are scheduled to conduct uh, final, uh, interviews of final, finalist candidates uh, this week. We hope to have a hire approved by the select board at the beginning of next month. Okay. Anyone else? All right. Let's vote on Article 30 to transfer uh, to appropriate $144,450 from the Community Preservation Fund General Reserve for HVAC for the Center Town Hall, also known as the uh, Chelmsford Center for the Arts. And it should be noted that it was community preservation money uh, that was used a couple million dollars easily. Uh, roughly 10 years ago, not only to refurbish the, ch the old town hall into the Chelmsford Center for the Arts, but also the North Chelmsford Town Hall and, and bring both of those buildings back into full use. So the, the notion passes that 120 we use the money, for opposed, one more extension. money for air conditioning is, is completely valid. valid. Mr. Wagner? Uh, Will Wagner, Precinct 3. I'd like to propose that, given that the final five articles are all easement articles, that we just finish them tonight. We have a motion to extend town meeting. Second. Do you want to do a voice vote on this? Yes. All in favor of extending the... F oh, we have seconds. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? All right. We're going into over, uh, 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 overtime here. Okay. Article 31. Article 31 is to, for the town to, to authorize the select board to grant a non-exclusive easement uh, on a portion of the Warren Pole property at 115 Parker Road um, for the property owner to pass and repass for the driveway on the land. Basically, the Conservation Commission and I are working on the uh, preservation restriction with the land trust and getting everything surveyed and finalized for, for the property. And we've come across two encroachments of driveways that were basically on the town's property. So we have two choices. Either we tell the property owners to take up the asphalt and relocate the uh, pavement and, and off the town land, or we give them a non-exclusive easement to cross the property. So in this case, where you see at 115 Parker Road, which is across from the right reservation, um, the property almost extends to the right of the driveway there. And then you, what you have is you have to the left of the driveway to the stone wall is also all that entrance that you see depicted on the driveway encroachment on the map. So basically what this would do is this would allow the property owner and their successors to have the right to pass uh, on that property um, into the future. If they did not have this easement granted, when they went to go, if they were to go to sell the property, they'd have quite a concern because, as you know, many mortgage uh, providers do a perimeter survey, and then this would this would be a concern. So we've we've met out there with the site, the two the two members of the conservation commission, the conservation agent, and I met with the property owners. What we're going to do is we're going to uh, erect a fence to the left of the existing paved driveway so that the public who's crossing from right reservation or the other way would stay to the left of it, i.e. off of the paved surface, um, and probably put signage there basically you know, indicating that it's conservation land and not to travel on night and so forth. But this is basically to, to provide assistance to the property owners. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you. Does the Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 31. Select Board have a recommendation. The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 31. Discussion? Tony Telling from Precinct 5. 
So when they put the easement, you're given the easement to use this property. Um, when they redo their driveway, do they not have enough land to move the driveway at that point, 10 years, 20 years from now? No, this would give them per, in perpetuity the right to resurface and reutilize that driveway forever. forever. It would be a considerable cost for them to relocate. No, I, know, I understand yeah. that, but every 20 years you have to replace your driveways. So. Yeah, no, they would have that right. They and successor property owners would have that right. But So that wouldn't be a requirement? No, no, and, and really this is not going to be a main entrance to the property, so there won't, you know, we, there's no scenario where the town would envision parking or other activity on that site because we have the parking lot across the street at the right reservation. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Hi, Liz Reinowich, uh, Precinct 11. I'm, you know, I understand that, you, you know, we want them to have access to their house, but when I looked at this, was, I don't know how old this 115 property is. Could you tell me when that was built? Oh, it was built uh, decades ago. In fact, the current pr property owner, I think, acquired it in 87. So it was, it okay. was, it was built you know, quite, quite a while ago. It's not a new development. Yeah, because it seemed to be totally landlocked when I looked at it. Is that true? If they didn't have this easement, there would be no way to get to that house, right? They, they would have to construct a new, a new driveway entrance ac across the property because it has frontage, as you can see depicted on the map. But it would be quite, a, quite an expense and effort uh, to do that. Because uh, what, what you what you see there is they, the, the the driveway kind of bends to the right, so they really would have to almost really make that a sharp driveway to to the to the property. Oh yeah, yeah, okay, yeah. Since there's yeah, okay, I won't ask any more questions. I would vote for. Thank you. Phil Stanway, Precinct Five A. I have a question about the abutters, in particular the 115 Parker Road and the Stedman Street. When I was on the committee that was looking. To put this together, we got venomous letters about not accessing through either of those. Are the two parties now on board and support this? Yes, as I said, I met out on the site with the conservation agent and two members of the conservation commission. In, in, in their perfect world, they'd like an exclusive easement, um, but, but basically they understand and, and at this point are supportive of the non-exclusive easement, meaning that it doesn't extinguish the town's right of the property, uh, but they but they provides them and their successors the right to pass over it. So yes, they are in harmony. They know this is being discussed this evening, and and then we'll work out the final language of the easement agreement after town meeting provides the authorization, um, if that's takes so, place. So both parties, the families who own the house, yes, um, do agree with this. Yes. Okay. As they said in the perfect world, they'd they'd like a non-exclusive easement, which is basically would be a sale of the property. Right. But. That's not, that's not what's being brought to the town. Okay. No further discussion. We will vote on Article 31 for an easement at uh, 115 Parker Road, non-exclusive easement. The article passes 105 in favor, three opposed, one abstention. Article 32. Article 32 is the same situation at 43 Hall Road. Uh, here, it's even more drastic. As you can see, the, the view from Hall Road is, is the driveway, the access point there. Um, and basically, this is, not, this is not across from any parking lot or, the, or other conservation land, and this will not be a public entrance to the property. Again, this is providing them with a non-exclusive easement to maintain the driveway at that site. It's an, it's an elderly woman who I've been in communication with. Um, she supports this request because she understands that, you know, when the trust were to move onto the property, this would facilitate that use. Again, this will be posted, you know, be posted as conservation land. I think the only people who would utilize it would be people probably from the neighborhood at, at Hall Road, but this is not meant to be a main ent entrance and area uh, to the Warren Pole property. Um, and so that's what we're requesting this evening because f to relocate that a driveway would, would, be, would be a considerable undertaking um, and expense in, at this, for this property owner. Finance Committee have a recommendation. Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 32. Select Board have a recommendation. 
The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 32. Uh, Go ahead. Mr. Moderator, Chris Garrahan, and uh, Precinct 3, also a chairman of the Conservation Commission. Uh, we, we support this, uh, this article. And again, this is something that's going to help out the, uh, the neighbors here and uh, clear up an encroachment situation. And it's, it's really a friendly uh, type situation. So please support this. Thank you. Thank you. Alvin Draymond, Precinct uh, 7. Uh, I am, could you please start the clock? I would like to uh, oppose this because looking at what it is, it's a skinny little piece of town land that is of absolutely no value to the town. It would seem to me to make a whole lot more sense that we sell it even if it's at a, a bargain, real bargain basement price and have, then have the town have no responsibility for this land at all. Uh, except maybe collect a couple tax dollars off of it over the many years. But uh, to make, for the town to keep owning that little strip does not make sense. And uh, so I'm, I'm just asking people to vote against it and then we rethink it and bring it uh, another idea uh, in the fall. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Charlene Archambault, Hall Road. Um, so I just wanted to say that um, I want to see what the city's plan to use for this space is. So I'm understanding that this is, um, you know, for a neighbor to be able to access their property, which makes sense. But what is the city's plan to use for entry and exit out of this space? There are no plans to create any public entry or access to the property. As we said, and we spoke to the property owner, if it becomes an issue with, with you know, there's really, you know, that an issue would arise, we would put appropriate signage out there to discourage that. But, but again, if you live in that neighborhood, it does provide you a way to get onto the Warren Pole property. Whereas, if we extinguish that right, um, then it's gone forever, and now you don't have access to conservation land. And again, forever is a long time. So, the, the many access points to the Warren Pole property may come of some foreseen use, whether it's whatever it may be in the future. But basically, there is no plans for, to create any parking on street, off street, or otherwise on this property. Like I said, we only expect that people who would probably utilize that would be people in the neighborhood. We are working to construct public parking off of Boston Road, which is the main entrance and parking area for the Warren Pole property. And there really aren't any immediate plans to draw any trails or other things in this area as well. So what I'm hearing is there is no public access um, no private access, but then I'm also hearing no immediate plans to access trails. So I, I guess I'm looking for, I'm, my question is, I'm looking for confirmation that there are no plans for any access off that point. There's no plans at this time. I, I can't speak for forever, but I can just, I, I think if the Conservation Commission were to do that, you know, that, that basically they would have discussions and meet with the neighborhood and also discussions with the holder of the restriction, which is the land trust, but there, but there, there really aren't any plans to do that. So I'm hearing at this time, no plans to gravel, no plans to pave, no. and no current plans for paths no. without notifying of butters. Exactly. Very good. Thank you. Yeah, we're Thank trying you. to do something for the benefit of the owner in this case. Hi. Um, Nancy Caraccio, 43 Hall Road. I'm the elderly person. <laughs> Thanks, Paul. <laughs> it's and you've waited all this evening to do this. Thank you. That's right. I've been here. Um, my husband and I brought the, bought the property and built the, on the property in 1985. And um, I please want to continue to be able to use my driveway and get to my home without having any, uh, I don't know, did someone say I should have to buy it or something? That strip? I don't know, did the past person say I have to buy it? I'm sorry, I had trouble hearing. But anyway, please approve it so I can continue to live in my home. Thank you. And I am elderly, I admit it. Okay. Let's vote on that. Article 32. Uh, voting to uh, grant a non-exclusive easement on town-owned Warren Pole uh, property driveway access at 43 Hall Road.
Article passes 99 in favor, three opposed, one abstention. Article 33. All right, this one's simple. This is the town accepting an easement at 15 Harvard Street. This was uh, approved by the planning board. This is the former Glenview uh, uh, facility site that's built in the condos. And when the project was approved uh, by the planning board, they required the ability of the little square, uh, little rectangle you see in the top left of the of the parcel there had to be granted for public safety access. So this has been approved for the project and now it's, it, we're seeking town meeting formal action to accept this easement for public safety purposes. Thank you. Does Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 33. Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 33. Any discussion? All right, let's vote on Article 33 uh, to grant this uh, uh, the, to acquire an easement on 15 Harvard Street for the purpose of emergency access by the police and fire departments. Article passes 99 in favor, 34 uh, opposed, and uh, no abstentions. Article 34. Article 34 is the final easement article, and this is accepting an easement at 240 Groton Road. Again, this was a project approved by the planning board down, down the street here uh, uh, near the highway interchange. Um, basically, as part of the project approved, they, uh, to, they quit, obtained a sewer easement to go out um, onto the adjoining roadway. Uh, and basically, again, we need you to accept it and so allow the town the ability to, to go out and maintain the sewer line that's out there onto the roadway. Finance Committee have a recommendation. The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 34. Select Board have a recommendation. The Select Board recommends approval of Article 34 with four in favor and one abstention. Any discussion? Apparently not. Okay, let's vote on Article 34 to accept an easement of land at 240 Groton Road for the purpose of sewer maintenance by the Department of Public Works. Article passes 99 in favor, five opposed, two abstentions. And now the final article of the evening and of the session. Article, article 35 is to authorize the select board to dispose or to sell a 0.73 acre parcel of town owned land located off of Summer Street uh, and under the provisions of the Massachusetts Uniform Procurement Law. Um, it's the parcel that's outlined in blue there. So basically, if you look at the corner of Bilricka and Summer Street, you see you've got the two parcels that have frontage on Bilricka Road at Summer, and then you have this blue parcel. And then what you notice is on that second parcel, you see that swimming pool and deck. Well, we were approached a few months ago by the estate of, the, of that property who were looking to sell the property, and they've got a problem. They can either do one of two things. They can either take the pool and the deck down or, they can, or the other option is they approach the town to see if the town would, would, would uh, sell this property. The uh, property is acquired by the town. It's mostly wet. It doesn't really show as well with the colors there, but it's mostly a wetland parcel of property. And so basically the, the uh, finance director who acquired the property as a tax possession would put out documents to sell it, uh, sell the property. Uh, you know, as you can 
that, that, and then that resolves the property and, and the town has no use for it. It really has no beneficial purpose to the town. Thank you. Does the select, uh, Finance Committee have a recommendation? The Finance Committee unanimously recommends approval of Article 35. Select Board have a recommendation? The Select Board unanimously recommends approval of Article 35. Any discussion? None. Uh, we shall vote on Article 35, which is uh, to uh, allow these people to keep their swimming pool. Uh. <clears throat> He's tough, no? Joe's tough. <laughs> Maybe he didn't get the list. <laughs> good job. Thank you. Good, good job. I'm glad we got it done. Article passes 107 in favor, four opposed, no abstentions. I'll entertain a motion to adjourn. All in favor? <laughs> Thank you very much. They said it couldn't be. All in favor say aye, and that brings to a close this one and only session of the Springtown meeting. Uh, it is remarkable to think that we got, well, not technically we didn't go through 35 articles because a few were, were removed, but the consent agenda helped. It helped that there were no zoning bylaws. Uh, or other really controversial subjects. I mean, the worst thing we had was tennis courts tonight, and even that was, uh, there was a compromise solution. It's also true that the, the three or four uh, articles right at the beginning having to do with the budget for fiscal 2023, Neshoba Tech, the town budget, the school budget, and, uh, and the capital budget, all passed with hardly a bleep, uh, a, a blip of, of commentary or, or discussion. It, perhaps it suggests that the town meeting members have gotten savvy as to what is or isn't possible in terms of, of modifying that budget. It's also possible that there's supreme confidence in our town officials to craft something that is, uh, that is workable. In any case, although we did run a little longer than we ordinarily would, 11 o'clock is the usual uh, turn into a pumpkin time. We did get this all done in one town meeting. I'm grateful for that because I wouldn't have been able to join you on Thursday if we continued. So for all of the staff and volunteers of Chelmsford Telemedia, we want to thank you for sticking with us tonight. We'll see you in the fall, if not sooner, at the 4th of July. Good night.